Let's do this. Get ready for the Dirt Life Show.
he was my navigator for the first day. Should be good now. So we're cruising along, and, uh, you know, he's doing a great job for learning between, because we use Lead Nav, we use Lowrance, and we have the rally book. And when we finally cross over the finish line, handing over our time card, everyone's all excited, handing us beers, and he's not saying a word, right? And all of a sudden, I'm like, bro, what's up? He's, he's like, uh, uh. I, I gotta throw up. I gotta throw up, right? <laughs> so we put, we have to pull dude, forward. You gotta you gotta make this story a little deeper, though. This dude is a big Samoan guy. I mean, he's got like the full like the hair, the long hair, the good beard. Like, I mean, like he's a good looking like Samoan dude. Like he's, he's actually a, he's actually one hundred percent Mexican. Uh, but we he just look make, he looks like a Samoan dude. Yeah. <laughs> so so anyways, he's just this yeah. And then he he jumps <laughs> out. His or first he's trying to get through the door. But we have a secondary locking system because we got a door slammer. And uh, that's still latched. He can't push through it. Finally, he stops, gets it undone, jumps out. His mane is just, like, flowing in the air. (laughs) And all of a sudden, oh, boy, just blows chunks everywhere, right? Well, the race tracker guys, the Stella guys, are right there. He's doing it right in front of them. So from, from that day on, every time they'd see him, they would just be like, hey, don't throw up this time. You know, just... He's like, man, I'm going to have to whoop that dude's ass just to get some respect back from him. But the funniest part about it was on the Instagram live, what he said was, he's like, at least I didn't throw up in front of the chicks. <laughs> he's like, also, I just didn't want to throw up in front of the checkered pants girls. Oh, man, that's funny. Have you ever made somebody throw up in the passenger seat? Uh, yeah, yeah. Co-riders that get seasick and, you know, get motion sickness, stuff like that. Yeah, so I've had I've had my fair share of co-riders that, that can't ride anymore because of it. So, uh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of Do people take any medicine for that? Or like, um, is that even Yeah, I've had co riders try different things, you know, um you know, trying to figure it out. Some some cured it with just chewing gum. You know, if they chew gum then they wouldn't get sick anymore. Wow. Others tried patch, you know, diet, you know, uh bracelets, just all kinds of different things. I've had two or three guys that, that had issues. Alex, Alex, from that day on, because then he drove the next day, and I was his co-dog. Oh. Um, but the third day where he was uh, co dog for me again, drama me. He's like, I'm not making that mistake. Again. He's fine. He was taking, yeah, no issues. Nice. That's cool. But, but then you also you know tell him certain things, too, like stop staring at the book in your yeah. lap. Hold the book up and, and – Pay attention to the book that way. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. So you're a little bit more focused. You got to yeah. keep your the eye on the high horizon and things like that. Yeah. And sometimes you tell them, you know, pretend like you're driving because if they, you know, head, head down and not paying attention, then they're, they're always swaying. It's just like they're on a boat. So yeah. you know all the tricks, I'm sure. I try. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, so if uh, if you guys didn't uh, hear the uh, little bit of the intro, I know you guys on Instagram Live did, but uh, we're going to talk about all kinds of fun stuff today. We're going to have story time with the Robs. We're going to play Are You Smarter Than a Third Grader? Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Nora 1000 Rally. Um, I want to talk a little bit about pre-running. Uh, we actually have a, a really fun camera shot over here of uh, one of your nice yeah. vehicles, right? That's yeah, that's my uh, my Lumacraft pre-runner. Long how, long, how long have you had that thing in action for pre-running? Uh, it's actually been around since 2006. Really? Yeah, it's got a lot oh. of miles on it. Nice. It just takes a little refresh every year or what? Yeah, once a year we go through the transmission. The motor just changed the oil, filters, but the transmission once a year, suspension twice a year, shocks, you know, once a year and just keep running it. And Whenever. it's been really good. Right there, it's still dirty from San Felipe. And, you know, about two weeks we'll be heading to uh, Ball 500. One of the uh, the crazy things that I always hear uh, or think about when I see these vehicles is I think, like, man, it's so – like if the if the vehicle could tell stories, like how many <laughs> miles and what different things have happened on the trail, you know what I mean? Like it's just an insane for me to think. Actually, you know what? Why don't you tell a cool story about pre-running that you've had over the past ten years that just like stands out? Oh, it's been a lot. I mean, ultimately, you know, this pre-runner was my dream for quite some time, and uh, always had a two-seat buggy. But I kept saying, hey, I want a I want a pre-runner that I can stop by the beach and make a sandwich. I used to pre-run with Walker Evans, and he had a – we'd bring an ice chest and we'd, in the Ram Charger, and, and uh, we'd stop along the ocean. So I said, you know, I want to do that, but I'm a buggy guy. And uh, so anyways, this was a dream of mine. It's got an electric refrigerator in it, and up there oh, in the nice. top box, um, there's actually a, a, a aluminum plate that goes on the front bumper to make a lunch table. Don't, don't really use that. Matter of fact, I don't think I've ever used it, but – Ultimately, um, you know, a ton of fun, three seats, a lot of fuel, spare parts. Um, you know, I've people have bought me uh, hot, you know, 12-volt hot dog makers with bun warmer, yeah. hot dog makers, so I have that. 
Um, you know, got an electric microwave for the thing. So, but that thing's been up and down the peninsula, you know, every, it's been pre-running, you know, every year since, uh, 2006 and, uh, got, I don't know how many miles, um, the GPS says 40,000 something, but I, I know it's, wow. it's at least, I guarantee it's double that. So, you know, usually, uh, but that, you know, speaking of pre-running stories, um, you know, that car right there, uh, scored at a race down there from, uh, Cabo to Loretto. And I was down there pre-running and had, a my co-rider wasn't able to make it down yet. So I had a, an old guy, you know, about 60 something years old and we were out there by Toto Santos and I said, hey, I want to pre-run this section one more time. And there's an access road. You know, I see it on the map that comes back out to the main highway. Just meet me there and I'll get back. And ended up, you know, pre running the desert section, got on the asphalt road. And we're just flying down the asphalt road headed east um, from the Pacific back into the Highway 1. And uh, just going down a road I've never been down before. And all of a sudden, got a little bit twisty and no big deal. You know, probably going way too fast. And uh, all of a sudden, the road just went over the rise, over the crest, and it started going right, 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 and it kept getting tighter and tighter. We were probably, you know, doing close to 100 when I first saw that. Oh, man. And um, as we're going, I'm, like, t- turning in, trying to make the corner, and the thing keeps getting closer and closer to the edge. So I got to turn in, except it gets loose. Now it's coming around, oh. so I got to turn the other way. So I'm just sitting there. It seemed like forever going around this corner, you know, turn it in. Oh, it's loose. Turn it out. Turn it in. Turn it out. Finally, I wasn't going to make it, so I just turned, pointed it straight, and it went right off the side of the road, and I had no idea where we were going. Um, you know, it was a downhill, went, jumped off that. As we're in the air, as soon as we leave the road, we're in the air, and all I see is trees. And then as it's going down, I see cows. And uh, I'm like, oh, we're going to hit a cow. Uh-oh. Landed. Uh, ba-boom. We made it. We didn't crash. Hit the brakes. Look up, and there's just cows scattered everywhere. everywhere. Didn't hit one. And I was like, oh, my God, that really just happened. And thank God, you know, it wasn't – you know, off a cliff into the ocean or a canyon or whatever. So we landed safely, you know, I downshifted, got it back in first gear, came back up on the road. And when I got up on the road, it's like, are you okay? You know, to the, to the, the guy, I can't remember his name right now. Um, and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm okay. And about that time, you know, right there on the inside of the corner, we got back up on the road. There was a Mexican rancher just standing there shaking his head. like, (laughs) (laughs) You're getting ready to pay me mucho dinero for one of those cows. Exactly. (laughs) That's hilarious. That's a good story though. And not like nothing happened. right? No, no. It's, it's amazing. And again, like I said, we basically, when I turned into it and committed to going straight off, like I had no idea what was straight off. Do you remember what his reaction was? He's just laughing. Honestly, he was a good (laughs) dude. His name will come to me, but he was a super high energy, you know, guy. And, um, actually, uh, Cisco B.O. used to ride with me. His dad, Poncho was chasing us. And then his good friend, um, it's not Mario, Gary, there's another one, but anyways, um, was riding with me and he was just so upbeat and like the, it was the coolest thing ever to him. The whole, the whole ordeal, you know, pre-running from Cabo to Loretto, he got to do a lot of that and he'd never experienced that stuff before. So that is definitely, definitely a lot of good times. Man, I don't know if you guys had any pre-running stories like that. No. Well, first of all, we've never pre-ran because the Nora is a, is a rally, so they hand everything to you. Oh, that's and right. we've done the Mint. That's a non-pre-run, you know, course. And uh, at least it is for our class. And, you know, so we're just out there having fun. Man. You know? <laughs> that is but such but a that good right story. there just cements why, uh, you know – I'm not a good co-dog at all, you know, because <laughs> I'm such a control freak. How hard would you have been puckered in that situation? I probably would have closed my eyes <laughs> yeah. and just waited for it to end. Uh, that's a good story, though. <laughs> hey, man, so, yeah, just like, uh, uh, let's see, David Peace just said, hey, story time with Rob is on. Yep, we're going to have some good stories coming out tonight. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Short Course, too, and see uh, how things are going with Short Course. Um I remember, like, uh, last time you started talking about the uh, old Pro 4 that's sitting over there behind the uh, – I don't think you can see it in this camera. Yeah, you can see the top of it. The top of it. Um, yeah, the newer Pro 4 is under the car cover there to the right, and then uh, – Nobody's allowed to look at that one. Yeah, not even don't us. look at that. It's top secret, but it's yeah. for sale. You interested? <laughs> <laughs> Come look at it. It's ready to go. Um, but I actually liked the, the stories of the older Pro 4 yeah. a little bit, and I was trying to remember what you said, but I couldn't, and uh, – you told us last time, I wanted you to tell Robert Bland a little bit about it because it's so nostalgic, but you said it was one of the best trucks you've ever actually gotten to drive, but it's not legal now? Yeah, no, it's that truck um, That truck was built by Knife Frank and Dave Clark and had air shocks on it, um, and that, that truck has 
quite a few, at least two or three rules that have been made um, against it. And because one of them, of yeah, because of it. So one uh, in short course racing, there's a rule that there's a, the minimum ride height's 10 inches. Well, it's because of that truck was seven inches. Um, there's also another one, air shocks. That truck had air shocks on it. Um, that truck, the last two years it raced, 2000, 2001, won, uh, it won 11 races both years. And I think we ran 16 one year and eight in the next year. So it won 22 out of how many wow. ever that is in those last two years. And then in December of, um, December of 2001, I got a letter from Marty Reed, who um, he owned core at the time. And I got a letter from him saying your truck is illegal and you're not allowed to bring it back. And I ended up making a phone call to him and I said, you know, um, you know, what's the reason for that? And on and on and on. And he said, it's just, that's what it is. And I couldn't argue with it anymore. And I said, you know, racing for me, it's my livelihood. It's how I put food on the table. And if you're going to make it harder for me to do that, I'm not coming back. And I think he didn't believe me because, you know, we were doing pretty good at it and so on and so forth. So the very next season um, that that series started core, um, I don't remember where the first race was, but I got a phone call from Frank D'Angelo who used to be with BF Goodrich. And he said, Rob, are you, are you coming? And I'm like, no, I'm not coming. And he goes, well, they have a spot for you here like you're coming. And I go, oh, Frank, crap. you know I'm not coming. So, um, you know, I ended up stopping racing in that kind of short course in 2001. Um, thank goodness um, a guy named Jim Baldwin, who's who's passed away recently. A lot of people don't know that. But Jim Baldwin of the New Corps, um, he uh, sent me another letter when he, he brought – he was running races back in the Midwest, and then he ended up bringing Corps – out here right and when he did that he ran uh some races at chula vista and he i ended up i have a letter i have a letter saying your truck's illegal it, from marty reed and then i have a letter saying from uh jim baldwin saying hey we want you to come race your truck again so <laughs> bring um, it out so bring it out but yeah that that truck there in the background that you saw earlier was uh built by nye frank and dave clark it had air shocks on it um very unique truck and um you know it was a pretty damn cool thing uh you know now it's just an expensive truck sitting there that's uh doesn't race anymore so a lot of good stories with that a couple rules that were made against it and uh you know a lot of good times man it's so crazy to hear those stories like they go back so far and the amount of off-road credentials that sit just in this pl building that we're sitting in rob is that, pretty fantastic. that truck no also doubt. no one rj anderson has a chance right now but that truck uh is the only truck that's won three of the uh labor day challenge races which back in that day they were called the borg warner trophy so that's the truck that's that the only truck that's won three of those in a row now rj's on two yeah and uh, i'm pretty sure he's getting ready to go back to try to do a three peat and uh good luck to him um maybe he could be the only the second person to do that so does any of that, like, make you, like, I kind of don't want him to beat my record? <laughs> well, you know, that that goes both ways, you know, honestly. Um, yeah, you, you don't want him to beat it, but also, you know, with, with time becomes development and, you know, rules are made to be broken. And, uh, you know, that's it's something that we did. It stood for a long time. That happened in 99, 2000, 2001 yeah. were those years. So it's it stood, I guess, for 20 years. Nobody's, nobody's beat it. And you always so. got to feel good about that progression, right? Like you've done it and had that record for so long. When somebody beats it, it's like, wow, I'm going to give this dude a pat on the back. That's no, good. it's absolutely true. And that's one of the unique things about off-road racing. You know, um, I think back and you see old videos and stuff and, you know, what the trucks look like. And what, a, what did a trophy truck look like in 2004? You know, I... In 1994, it was the first year of Trophy Truck, and I was actually an I-Beam Class 8 truck and won that championship. And, uh, you know, I giggle for quite some time, you know, about five years ago, you know, people say the Trophy Trucks are the guys, the drivers are better than they ever were. And I'm like, you know, I came from old school and I'm part of yeah. new school as well. And I said, no way. In 94, we had Ivan Stewart, Walker Evans, you know, um, just some of the baddest dudes there were. Yeah. And I'm like, no, these guys aren't them. Well, now... I'm starting to say to myself, you know what? We got some really bad dudes right now. Yeah. You know, Andy, Luke McMillan, Bryce Menzies. You know, there, there's there's 20 guys that can all haul the mail. So it's just yeah. different perspective. Hey, and so uh, actually, I'm going to use this right now. So everybody that's watching, uh, I'm going to ask Rob, and I don't know, sometime during the show, who your Mount Rushmore of off road is. So start thinking about who you yeah. put on that bad boy. Um, actually, you guys too, you think about who your Mount Rushmore of off road is. I know in my Mount Rushmore of off road, he's one of the top dogs that I would pick. So. Um, before we have our uh, secret guest call in, I'm going to thank our sponsors. Um, so thank you very much to uh, all the guys over at, uh, I know you're a Vision Wheel guy, but that uh, KMC and EFX, um, those guys have supported the show since day one. So thank you very much to uh, both Ryans over at uh, at 
<laughs> excuse me, wheel pros over there. You can always go to uh, KMC Wheels and get your uh, get your wheels. You can go down to Four Wheel Parts. You can buy wheels. So look at the KMC stuff, man. They got some awesome stuff. Uh, if you want to get any of the merch, like the hats and uh, T-shirts and stuff like that, you can go to wheelmerch.com. Check it out. They got a whole bunch of cool stuff, man. Uh, thank you very much to the guys over at Shock Therapy. Um, they've done some fantastic stuff uh, that we can talk about maybe today, or you can look at some of the Instagram stories that we posted uh, to the Unicorn YXZ that we have. Um, they do awesome stuff for Polaris, Can-Am, everybody. Um, they can get your side-by-side uh, -side all set up with the ride improvement system. They got steering racks. They got t they got everything, man. So use the code DIRTLIFE over at shocktherapist.com or uh, just give them a call and say the Dirt Life sent you, and they'll help you out. Uh, thank you very much to the guys over at Zollinger Racing Products. Uh, Travis has been really pushing uh, the RS1 stuff. They've been doing some development on new pro parts and products for that thing. Uh, they've been always doing stuff for the Can-Am. So go check out ZollingerRacingProducts.com for all their new stuff. They have tons of accessories. Uh, use the code DIRTLIFE and you can save a whole bunch of money at their website. Uh, thank you very much to Josh over at CryoHeat for being a part of the show. They make some fantastic parts. Uh, uh, or added bonuses to some of the parts that they have. And they do Polaris uh, Pro Mod transmissions. That's the one I keep pumping because they're so much lighter than a, uh, a stock one. I don't know uh, if you've ever seen them or if Caden, uh, your son, has ever seen them, but they're uh, all heat-treated, so they roll, have less rolling resistance. I think there's something like 15 or 20% less weight and mass in the transmissions. They're actually really cool for the UTVs. Yeah, nice. Uh, so go ahead and check out cryoheat.com. And uh, if you have any uh, questions, give them a call over there. Tell them the Dirt Life sent you. And thank you very much to the guys over at SolderWeld. They have uh, these awesome welding blankets and uh, off-road repair kits. You can use the code DIRTLIFE at SolderWeld.com. You can save your uh, race or your ride by using one of their kits. Um, and like I always say, every time, thank you guys for joining us because you guys are our lifeblood. So please uh, always go on uh, Facebook 5 p.m. on uh, or YouTube 5 p.m. on Mondays, and you can hang out with us. If you can't, check us out live on Mondays. You always got dinner with the family or whatever it is, you can uh, check us out in the archives on iTunes and all of the different podcast networks, Spotify, Amazon, every one of them. So, um, man, we're going to have some serious fun tonight. I don't know when we should, like, throw in Are You Smarter Than the Third Grade? That was like a seriously long freaking thank you for sponsors. Look at all those questions that are rolling in. Right. I just said, look at Caden Danbury asked, like, 16 questions, 30 minutes ago, <laughs> what was Rob's first race vehicle? All right. And John Lewis has been sharing rad stuff forever, so, trying to take it back to the early 90s. And wow. Let's, let's get through some of these comments. But why um, we're doing that, I'm going to try to think of ways to get through that quicker. I don't know if I could talk <laughs> any faster. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Story time with Rob is on. That's a full send. John Lewis says, let's uh, take it back even further uh, than the old Pro 4. Let's hear some Mickey Thompson Stadium Series Grand National Sport Trucks. Dang, that was a long time ago. Yeah, those trucks were little and skinny, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They were actually. When I look back now, they're like a mini truck. So he's talking um, like ninety three ish. Yeah, right? yeah. I started racing uh, Mickey Thompson in nineteen eighty eight, maybe eighty nine for Walker Evans, and then in ninety one moved to the Ford Rough Rider program. But those trucks, they were they were small, and uh, they had a really low ride height. Matter of fact, in the moguls and stuff, you had to go fast or you get high centered. A lot of times, those trucks they were they had a rhythm section, so it was like a you know about a two or three foot high jump and then there was two and then there was a gap and two and then like that you try to sometimes you try to quad them but you'd lad, land on the land on the chassis and man sometimes they hurt but the bumping and banging and you look at some of the old videos google that stuff mickey thompson stadium stadium uh, trucks and you you we would basically just drill each other in the door and i look back at the videos and now and i'm like Oh my God, like, look what we're doing, just trashing each other. But it makes me remember why my back hurt so much when I was younger compared to now, you know. But yeah, Mickey Thompson, great days in racing Anaheim Stadium. You know, I got to travel all across the country. I've been to, to Montreal. I raced in Tokyo with, with trucks. And How different was the actual racing portion of it, like, in those stadiums? Because, like, you couldn't do that with the new trucks. Uh, not really. I mean, as anything, you know, you, the truck gets purpose built to what it's trying to do, you right. know, and um, those trucks, they had to be battle worthy. We used to call it. They had to have big bumpers, you know, yep. front and rear protecting the body work and the, the rear, the rear uh, bumpers wrapped around trying to protect the fiberglass. In the beginning of the Mickey Thompson, when I started, the actual the roofs and the door skins were steel. Um, and then the, the rest was body uh, fiberglass. But as time went on, and that's kind of a funny story, we always used to wonder why did why did they come up with colored duct tape 
Well, the joke is in Mickey Thompson, because the bodies were all patched together and to get the lo- the branding pr- back, you had duct tape to put back uh, on there. So uh, yeah. the so colors match it. Yeah, it's just kind of a joke because in the <laughs> end, um, you know, and we also we raced three times in one night. So you had practice during the day. 7 p.m. was the first heat, you know, about 830, the second one. And then the final main was at 11. So it was a lot like Supercross for you guys who haven't seen it. It was like Supercross layout. You had the heats and then the main and there was the Grand National Sport Trucks, the Super Buggies, the Ultra Star. There was motorcycles, quads, everything. It was really production, but man, and they some were of the, all based off of like like uh, production yeah, mini trucks, mini mini S10, trucks, S10s, yep, Rangers. Yep, your Chevy. So at that time, and those were some of the best times ever in off road, honestly. And be, it's because we had manufacturers involved. Ford yeah. was involved, Jeep, you know, Chevy, Dodge, um, Nissan, Toyota. They were all involved, and that's you know those were some of the best times for me. And the whole my whole racing career was that mainly when I look back at it, it was because manufacturers involved were involved. You had tire companies, wheel companies, beer companies at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, a lot of that brings other great stories. But um, there was always Mickey Thompson leads me right into a story. But Mickey Thompson, they always had a host hotel. So all the teams stayed at the same hotel. So after the night of racing, you can imagine when we're all bumping and banging, uh, there's people pissed off. One of the rules during the race was when you when you finish your heat and you get out you leave your helmet on for a little bit you didn't take your helmet <laughs> yeah, off so really? you, you can imagine why yeah a lot of times people, people be a little bit pissed up. off oh yeah yeah <laughs> when robbie gordon came on board and you had frank and al arciero walker evans you know ivan stewart rod millen roger mears roger mears jr and there was others you know danny thompson different years but um there'd be bumping and banging there was always someone pissed off so the rule was you know keep your helmet on for a few minutes after uh, make sure everything's good hey so what since we're talking about rivalries right now i got a surprise guest on the line for yeah you. <laughs> right on his name is uh carl renners oh yeah right on <laughs> what's up carl how are you doing buddy are you still there i won <laughs> yeah, <you did>. uh, <laughs> he can't even talk <laughs> so carl can probably hear us because he's still waiting on the on the line i'm going to give you a call back real quick carl and see what's going on with this audio but uh yeah so Carl is uh, – I want him to share a couple stories because you guys have had some fantastic battles over the years, man, like some really, really good ones. Yeah, and absolutely. So it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see. Hello. Carl Renazetter, what's up, bud? Hey, guys. How are you Rob, doing? Long time, r- long time no talk. Yeah, absolutely. Carl, how are you doing? Glad hearing I'm from you. I'm good. Yeah, likewise. It's good. Life is good. Hey, yeah. so uh, Rob was just telling us a little bit about the uh, Mickey Thompson days. Uh, do you remember, like, when you first uh, got news that a guy named Carl Renazetter was going to start racing again? Well, I do. I remember um, there was a guy named Mike Leslie, and he had a Pro 2 with Lucas Oil sponsorship, and I think I was uh, – I remember being back at Crandon. Um, I knew Carl was already racing. I was pretty aware of Carl and, and racing desert stuff. They ra- used to race a two-seat Chenis when they first started uh, along with the, the Baldwin family. And, uh, yeah, Carl started if, you know, it's my story, but uh, Carl can correct me when, when, when I tell, my, when I tell my, my story, then you can correct me. But, yeah, you, Carl showed up uh, with Mike Leslie running the Pro 2, and that was – What race was that at? Uh, uh, it was – was it Grandin? Anago? No, An- Anago was the first one. I actually had uh, heard LeDuc prep a, a truck of mine, and, and then I, te- I teamed up with Leslie – and I literally showed up in a parking lot. My truck was sitting there. And I don't know if you remember Dennis Elmore, but he worked for Kurt LeDuc, and he was my crew chief, and I just went out and started racing. Yeah. Dude, that that's the way to do it, man. These old stories are so cool to hear because it would be so difficult to do that nowadays, right? Yeah, we, you know, Carl, I'm sure, like I did, you know, he raced motorcycles, I know, and I, I did as well. And, you know, we both had a huge passion for this stuff. And, you know, Carl's success, you know, I can – relate to it and also know his success was because of his passion honestly he loved doing it and he went after it he went after it hard and he won a lot of races so uh before we get into i want to ask uh, carl about maybe a story or so that he remembers but before i'm going to tell a little story and it was about the first uh short course race that i ever went to and it was um maybe 2000 
2012 ish or so, and uh, it was at Wild Horse Pass. And I've told this story a couple times on the show that you guys, both of you, you and Carl, were it was like a knockdown, drag out MMA match, dude. <laughs> and it, but it was also like poetry on wheels at the same time, right? And uh, at the end of the race, I think you guys both had your front fenders, but no rear fenders. Yeah. So it was like that was pretty good, right? But you guys, the, the tires, you couldn't see the writing on the side of the tires because the tires were smoked. But man, it got me to the point where I was like, shit, this is actually bitching. Like, I love this stuff. Absolutely. Just because you two. Uh, I would say, I would say for the most part though, Rob and I were pretty good. You know, we've had our moments, of course, because we're pushing so hard with, you know, 900 horsepower fire breathing dragons under us. But, but I would say that as far from my perspective, I, I never drove with somebody as skilled as, as Rob being able to race, you know, and, and work the track and understand, okay, I'm giving up this position, but I know I'm going to get it at, at this next place. That was, that was some of the coolest stuff for me, for sure. Yeah. Likewise for me, Carl, um, you know, there was, if there was ever a time that I was laughing and grinning, not winning, <laughs> it was racing yeah. with you. Honestly, I, I, <laughs> when we got in some of our battles and, uh, you know, wheel to wheel and stuff, I, I, you know, trying to work you, you working me and, and whichever, whoever came out on top, um, those were honestly, you know, we, we had enough battles that that's the ones I appreciate the most of in yeah. all my racing career and short course, honestly, battling with you, um, you know, the respect that we gave each other. And yes, we, ha- we, as everyone does, we had our, yeah. our run-ins, of but, course. um, yeah. but for the most part, uh, and I, I've told you that before, I've told your family and, and everyone, even Augie, your son, I, you know, and, right. uh, Frank, Frank, uh, who was your spotter yeah. cameraman and some of the, yeah. your mom, your dad, and all that stuff. So some of my best racing memories on the track without winning is actually battling you and, and trying to work you honestly. And, and, yeah. uh, yeah. Can you imagine? Awesome. Uh, so Carl, we have Robert Blanton of Warfighter made in the, uh, on the show with us here. He's co host and Rob, could you imagine, um, cause both of these guys racecraft is elevated. Like it's higher than most people. Right. And so could you imagine what either like, cause their thought process is probably similar when they're on course, right? They drive different and stuff, but their m- mentality is kind of the same. Could you imagine what's going on inside their heads and on their face during these times when they're just <laughs> battling so hard? <laughs> the, the, the focus is probably, you know, off the, just charts. Off the charts and, and, you know, I could just imagine the setups and, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to try and, push them wide in this corner so I can get on the inside and whatnot. But my, my first Laura's race was around 2013 also, and it was when Warfighter Maid was just getting introduced into short course. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the we were a part of the regional series, but then when the Nationals came around, it, it was, especially when Pro 4 was yeah. Pro 4, um, you know, watching you guys was always was always kind of the the, the highlight. And and we were also hanging out in the Rockstar tent. Yeah. So, you know, it's <laughs> those were some great races. I think back in um, you know, how how uh you know you know, glad I am to be part of that and just you know, it was an amazing thing when uh, Jim Baldwin had core going on and we were racing at Chula Vista or Pomona when he dug a big hole in the in the mm-hmm. asphalt and racing on the asphalt. Just an amazing <laughs> thing. But um, you know, and then, you know, Carl racing in Pro Two and Pro Four and how many how many times, Carl, do you think he won uh we swept the weekend where you won both pro two and both pro four races. I rem- you know, it, it, it was interesting. There were, there was a few, but then, you know, even, even if you, you win a lot, you still remember those, those weekends where you just like had just a terrible race and you just felt terrible. You know, I mean, it was, it was so up and down, you know, and um, that's, that's what was great about it though. Cause you wouldn't appreciate the wins if you didn't have those struggles where it's just like oh my god i couldn't even drive today what the heck happened you know yeah did, did you guys work in but you guys both probably had the same thing we'll let carl answer this one but carl did you have any um weekends where like let's just say you just got waxed it was just a bad weekend whether you're broken down or you just didn't drive good or whatever it was and the next weekend you just came out swinging against mccachran here well there there were definitely um tracks that that i tended to do dip, do better at than others I struggled at the end with, uh, with, um, Estero beach and it's ironic because that's kind of where I first started driving my short course truck, learning and setting it up and everything. So I thought I'd have an advantage there and it was kind of the opposite. I just couldn't get my truck to work really good in that sand, but you know, like Crandon and some other tracks down in San Diego and wild horse, it just, I, I seem to have my setup pretty good. So 
you know, it just kind of depends. And then, you know, remember the tracks prep different all the time too. Yeah. So it changes. So, you know, you have to be adaptable and, uh, you know, Rob and I were, we were always there. <laughs> always. Carl, yeah. always Carl just uh before this we went to go have some tacos and they were good but uh we were chit and chatting <laughs> and I was trying to talk these two guys into tell them on their bucket list they need to go back to Crandon and uh that's a question yeah. for you we we, we want to see you back there too I know I know before you retired that you mentioned you wanted to get back there but you know yeah. someday you need to show up if you don't show up for for racing maybe come yeah. back and hang out yeah, I would love to do that. You know, my family, you know, that's, that was one of their favorite things to do. And one thing, one thing I, now that I'm retired, I, I didn't realize as much then as I do now is how important those experiences were to my family, my kids, because, you know, that, they, that affected them so much being able to go to back to the Midwest and to have those experiences at the races and to do the things they wouldn't be able to do, like go to those lakes or, you know, see the people run around the pits, all that stuff. It's just a pretty special thing for them. Yeah, absolutely. As we get older, likewise for myself, um, same thing, reminiscing. The kids are all getting older. I think all yours are um, – Augie's the only one that's under 20 probably. I know him and yeah. Caden are both – I think they're both 19. But, you know, all the yeah. kids, that we, you know, we call them track kids or track babies. You know, they grew <laughs> up at the track. And yeah. as they get older, you know, you sit at the dinner table or some story comes across and, you know, you think back and you're like, wow, I, I, I thought I was – you know, hindering these kids and taking them away from other things, but also uh, realizing when they tell stories about the, how much they appreciated that and getting to see the country and, like you said, different lakes. And oh, yeah. But anyways, made Absolutely. a lot of good memories for them as well. That's one of the things yeah. that I think people in racing don't uh, – I don't want to say they don't – they don't do, like – how do I say this? You, you don't – like for me, I don't conduct an interview about a certain race usually. Like we don't talk about the race as it was – what the hell happened? It was like, what good, fun times did you have? And it's exactly what you guys are talking about. Like, you get to experience going fishing while you're there. You get to experience all these different things. Because there's so many races that I've done, not as many as you guys, but that I don't remember anything about the race. I just remember the weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, the weekend was the f- the fun part, right? Like, so that's no, cool. for sure. Yeah. No, and the relationship that you develop over the time and the experiences. I mean, I can guarantee you both Rob and I have, more stories than, than we've forgotten, you know, but, you know, sitting around for a while and talking, you know, just these memories, especially in Baja, because so much stuff happens down there and, you know, pre-running and the racing and stuff. I don't know. You agree, Rob? I, it, I just, I mean, I, I wish I could write them all down. Because, yeah. You know, I, I, them. I, uh, what, you guys don't have diaries? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so Walker Evans, so let me go back just a step. So Ba 1000, a lot of you guys don't know, but Carl Renazetta, myself, and Mark Post won the 2007 Ba 1000 overall together. Together? So yeah, so Carl, I started. Carl drove in the middle about 300 miles, and then uh, Mark Post finished, and uh, we ended up winning that race. Um, Carl didn't know. He ended up doing his section and went home, and uh, we got down there to the finish line. I think I woke up the next day, and I'm like, where's Carl? You know, he went home, and it's like, damn. But anyways. Did you know that, Rob, that, that they won the Baja 1000 together? Hell yeah, I knew that. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's, yeah. that's rad, well, man. You know, it's a funny story, though, Rob, is I remember coming in and seeing you the truck, and you look in, and you're like, hey, how come you don't have your lights on? I'm like, oh, they don't work. He's like, click. How yeah. about this switch? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. So or, oh Oren, a lot of you guys know Oren Anderson. Uh, he's Oren. Little, become a little bit famous. But Oren rode with – he pre-ran and rode with uh, with Carl. And he also worked for Riviera at the time, and he was Carl's co-writer. And I remember him coming on the radio, and they say, yeah, the lower lights, they don't work. And I'm like, oh, shit, we got – you know, I got to drive, you know, seven more hours at nighttime and I'm like the lower lights don't work this is terrible and they come in at that time if you remember Carl you were down there by Vizcayano just a little bit north yeah. of San Ignacio and we were pitting yeah. on the right side of the highway but they told you you had to go past the pit make a u-turn and come backwards to pit the opposite uh-huh. direction because the yep. the fuel was on uh, the driver's side so uh yeah exactly when I got in the try give orange shit I never never give K, uh, Carl shit for that but Oren every once in a while I give him shit for that I go remember that time we won the ball 1000 together and you didn't think the you didn't 
You didn't smart know how to enough, turn on the lights? You weren't smart enough to turn the lower <laughs> lights on? Maybe but, maybe he was just trying to save them for you because, yeah. you know, you had a you had a rougher section. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good story, though, man. Uh, so let me uh, catch up on some of the comments here. I think you'll actually dig some of these comments here, Carl. Um, but uh, one of the first ones was John Huppert's asked, did you ever race against Jimmy Johnson? So maybe that's a question for both of you guys. I, I never did. No, I didn't either. I was in Pro 4 when he was in Pro... Uh, no, no, I did. S- sorry. See, I, I got to remember my own story, so remember what happened. So, yeah, Mickey Thompson days. Right there at the end um, of Mickey Thompson, Jimmy moved up from... Uh, he was racing the little... They, I forgot what they were called. They were kind of like a trophy cart, but you sat in like an Odyssey. Light kind yeah, of thing, super yeah. light. I think that's what they were called. Yeah. So he was racing those, yeah. and then he moved up. Uh, Chevy had got their eye on him, and they moved him up into the Grand National Sport Truck. So I raced with him against him for one year. Um, he also went back and raced in the Midwest Series Soda, but he was in Pro 2 and I was in Pro 4, and that must have been before you were doing it, Carl. Before me, yeah, yeah. Yep, just before. And we'd love to have him yeah. come back. I keep – I keep waiting for Jimmy to come back and do dabble in off road a little bit, but right now he's doing yeah. the Indy car stuff. But hopefully right. someday we get him back out there. He might. He might. Uh, yeah, and then Caden Danbury asked, "I'd like to hear both your guys' what was your guys' first race vehicles?" So, hmm. so mine because they told me about it earlier. Mine was a uh, a high jumper, single seater, no power steering, no radio, no spare tire. It was a Type One. Uh, IRS transmission in a one two sixteen hundred car. So it was a car um, that was sitting completely apart. And I think it was 1981. I was into sports in high school playing basketball. And my dad said, you want to try off-road racing? And I said, sure, but what if I don't like it? He goes, well, we'll sell the car and move on. So first <laughs> race I did it, I loved it. And I quit playing basketball and I went racing. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, all right, what's this comment over here, Blanton? Let's see. Uh, seriously, how does Rob always have the perfect hair, especially after he takes his helmet off? Which Talking Rob? about you. <laughs> That's you. you. Her hair's always perfect, too. <laughs> hey, Carl, you can't see their hair, but both of them have pretty nice-looking hair this, this evening oh, over here, nice. dude. <laughs> That's nice. So, so Carl, was your first desert car a two-seat Chenneth? Yeah, yeah, the beam it car. It was. Really? Yeah. And, uh, well, it wasn't mine. It was my father-in-law's. He was, uh, he was a real estate guy and, and he had a engineer. His name was Bill church. You probably remember them, Rob. Yep. Remember the church guys. And he was one of the, he was their engineer. So he took, he took them out, um, uh, in the, in the cars cause they were big into the Baja stuff. And at the time I was racing motor motorcycle and, um, he bought uh, two cars to go pre run around. So I remember the first time um, we went and, and drove them. I went out for the first the first uh, drive, and we went to um, it's uh, what's that dry lake uh, out there by behind Big Bear? That's not Soggy, is it? Yeah, Soggy's out there. Yeah, Big okay. Bear Soggy Dry Lake. Yeah, so and that's the one that they have like that road that that's like a you know raised up, and there's a dry lake. So, anyways, I drove. I went out and drove this thing and I saw this road. It's probably like five or six feet high, you know, one of those raised elevated roads. Um, and I launched it and I cleared the road, landed on the flat on the other side. Oh. I think I broke, broke it in half. <laughs> Dude. So, so Jim didn't let me drive it after that for quite a while. <laughs> He's got to fix it all. <laughs> so for you guys also this, this Chenneth that Carl drove, um, was actually built by Butch Dean. So the oh, Valley, Perf- right. yeah. So, the Valley Performance Butch Dean, um, you know, it's a, there's a lot of history there with, with the Collins brothers, Herbst, you know, myself, Jack Johnson, Rolf Tiblin, Bud Camp, and just on and on. But the, the Church family and the Baldwin family, yeah. along with Carl Renazetter, there was a lot of Chenneth uh, cars that came out of there. So, um, yeah, a lot of history. Just thought I'd mention something about that. The first time I ever heard yeah. about a Chenneth was uh, Jeff Furrier from UPR. He yep. had uh, showed me his, and those things are pretty cool, man. I never knew how uh, nostalgic they were. Yeah, they were pretty. Hey, Rob, do you remember when when I first started driving those? They had the Kernet Kernet shocks, which were like the weird needles in the hole, the uh, orifice, whatever they call that. Yep. And then and then when they switched them out to uh, Custer, which was the pre pre uh, King, it, it was just a huge game changer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, couldn't even imagine the difference in how those how much faster you could go. Yeah, the the Kernets are that's. Uh... They were pretty cool in their day, and they were. They were um, the piston had no valving or no valve stack in it. There was just needles. Imagine uh, yeah. a six pins, yeah. 
in, you know, six pins that went, uh, well, two of them were guide rods and they went the whole length of the inside of the can inside the shock. And then there was uh, four more that were different lengths and they'd shut off a hole. So that was really your valving. So it was a pretty amazing yeah, thing. Right. They were super loose and sloppy <laughs> around right height, but until um, they started closing the holes off, they got stiff. So yeah, they were yeah, in their yeah. day, they were pretty badass. And ultimately I just dawned on me a couple of years ago. The reason why I like my cars kind of loose and sloppy is that's because, what I started that. with. Yeah. That's what you learned on? Yeah, really? that's what I learned on. That's awesome. Wow, yeah, they were definitely loose. But I remember it used to, they used to like the, the back would come up a lot easier with, yeah. that, with that valving. Unless we didn't have a valve drive. But I remember when we put on those Custer shocks, man, it was like that car stayed planted. And it was it was fun. I love those love those channels. Yeah, a guy, uh, guy named Don Custer uh, used to – my first introduction to him was with Walker Evans, and Don Custer used to ride in the Ram Charger pre-running, and the Ram Chargers had Rancho shocks on them, and they had, you know, 16 on each corner. Not that many, but – Yeah, they had tons yeah, of so shocks. And Custer, you know, like Walker, it's like, we got to do something about this, and a guy named Don Custer ended up coming out with the Custer shocks, which was the precursor, like Carl said, to King. And I think the King – some of the King, uh, the father, um, worked – I believe he worked for, for – uh, Custer, yeah, not sure about that, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so that was a game changer right there. Those that yeah. time of period in off-road racing, going from the small 2.0 shocks to the at that time the Custer was threes. threes. Yep. Hey, so David Peace commented in and said uh, that your hair has its own Instagram account. It yeah, it did for a while there. <laughs> did it really? And then, yeah. And then, and then <laughs> Robert Hargis says Rob saves space in his race suit for a comb. For perfect hair on every podium. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does, does does Rob know how many core Lucas races were delayed by the staging due so he could finish his story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Car- Carl Carl was in some of those. We you know on the podium. Well, no, before <laughs> and after, but the, one, the ones before we we'd end up talking stories and. Uh, you yeah. know, how many times, Carl, were we sitting there, you know, waiting for our race up in pre-grid and the, the pre-grid guy would come over. They get 10 minutes, you know, five minutes, and we keep talking. Pretty soon he's like, they're yelling and screaming, you guys got to get in your trucks. And <laughs> finally the, the, the staging guy, he would, instead of coming over and tell us, he'd just tell race director at that time, in the end it was Greg Fouts, he'd just tell Greg, it's story time with Rob, so you're just going to have to wait. <laughs> and I don't, think, I don't think we ever were talking about racing either. No. About everything else. Absolutely. <laughs> Just shooting the shit. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, yeah. David also commented in and said, uh, the Carl passing line at the Vegas track. What was that all about? The Carl passing line. Did you have some sort of secret line at the track in Vegas? Well, there was, there was one and that off for a couple of years, uh, there, that off camber chicane. Remember that Rob? Yeah. I, I had a nice little line through there, but you know, I don't know. Is that what they're talking about? Maybe that's it's a secret everybody line. Figured, everybody figured it out. Yeah. I feel like there's no secret lines on a short course track. <laughs> um, what's the next one that, uh, that actually, you might know this person, Amber. <laughs> Amber? What does yeah. Amber say? Yeah, I know. She I... says, so fun fact, Rob and I's daughter, Kayla, is dating Carl's second cousin. Someday <laughs> that will be a great wedding. The McCacherins and the Redizetters and the Baldwins under one roof outside of race. Also, oh, yeah. okay, what the question really is, what for, what vacation are you guys going to go on all together? I don't know. I don't know if Carl knows, but yeah, I, I'm sure he knows. Uh, yeah, Franz is dating Amber's daughter, Kyla, and yesterday yep. we were at the, the lake together, Lake Mojave on the, and, uh, you know, so we were having some stories with you, and they brought up, you know, maybe um, Carl could send us to Fiji. Oh, yeah. That's, a, that's an easy deal. You know, it's funny. You So you were just at Lake Mojave? Yeah. So um, about three weeks ago, I took my parents. My parents have a place there yep. in Bullhead. We talked and about I, that yesterday. <laughs> and I hadn't and I hadn't been back since Laughlin, 2008. Wow. To, to there, just because life busy. So I took my parents up there because they had been in the house for COVID, and I wanted to take them out on the lake. They weren't feeling up to it, so I went out and rented a sea do, and I went around every single cove from co- from not quite Cottonwood, but all the way you know, like the telephone lines down to, you know, in and out. Just so much fun. Yeah. I love that lake. Yeah, it was great. That's some serious dedication going in and out of every single one. Oh, oh smoke, yeah. Man. Well, it's like, a, it's like a race course. Yeah. Uh, I'm right Super with you. Cool. We did the same thing yesterday. We were going yeah. in and out, just sightseeing and getting in those, yeah. seeing how far in you could go. with. Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, it's beautiful. And the water there is clear. Yeah, it was really clear. And, 
surprising yeah, yesterday. It. Yep. Hey, so when was the first time uh, – actually, I'd like to ask both of you guys this question. So you know when you – we'll call it in quotes – met Carl, but when was the first time you were like, wow, this guy's the real deal? Well, I can tell you a quick story. So and, – and this goes way back in, in my memory because, you know, the first exposure I had to Rob – was really in the desert and the most vivid memory I have. And I think I even told you this before, Rob was down in San Felipe and I was uh, up ahead of our past zoo road crossing. And I was watching the trophy trucks and it was like, I, I, maybe I broke earlier. I don't know what happened, but I was watching and Rob hit that zoo road. And I swear to God, he was as high as the telephone wires <laughs> man, or the power wires. I was like, Holy shit. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, back in the day, the zoo road used to be a big jump, and, and it wasn't quite as rough on both sides, so you could hit it and just sail as far as you Launch. wanted to. No, you didn't yeah. have to check up at all? Uh, no, no. Well, we weren't going as fast. <laughs> back then, if you were doing uh, 75 through the up that road, you were going fast, and now, you know, yeah. pretty much doing 100. In the, wow. the Carl, do you remember what time frame that was? Well, it was um, it was when he was in the, um, in the you know, the Ford – Class eight Richard, Rough Rider days. Yeah, yep, exactly. So yep. yeah, Rough Riders started ninety one, went to ninety six. So I drove class eight, ninety one, ninety two, ninety three, and then ninety four was the first year of the trophy truck. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Do you remember um on the opposite end when you first uh like felt like Carl was gonna be a heavy hitter competition against well, you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the beginning, you know, obviously, you know, I pay attention and I knew that they raced the Chennis and then uh Jim Baldwin built uh for Jason and Josh and Carl, they had some, uh, some trophy trucks and, um, you know, Ryan Cadella. yeah, Cadella. Yes. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they, they were pretty successful with those. And then, you know, Carl in short course, you could tell that I think he, in my, you know, my opinion, he got, uh, pretty focused on that yeah. and, um, you know, became worked at it hard. And whenever, you know, typically whenever somebody has passion like Carl did and work hard at it, they're successful and, he did. He, he got into the short course racing, went all in, and ended up winning a lot of races. Well, I don't know how you feel, Blanton, but for me, I feel privileged to be talking to both of these dudes. Uh, Carl's not here with us, but it's uh, it's pretty rad, man, because I look up with both the guys in racing. It's definitely rad just to kind of sit here and listen to them go back and forth, you know. It is cool. Um, I know that our audience members are definitely digging it as well. Uh, you got any funny stories that are kind of off-the-track stuff, Carl? Off-the-track stuff? I mean, you know, not really. I mean – you know, we all kind of had fun at, at night after pre-run or, or after races, especially down in San Felipe or down in Cabo. I mean, do you remember? I remember having a bar bar brawl down in. I don't know if you were there at uh, Squid Row after one of the thousands and something happened and everybody was clearing out. There was some crazy stuff going on, but I don't know. Dang, that sounds pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at this guy. <laughs> hey, he's, Rob's probably the one that started it, and then he just took off, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, man. Yeah, we had so many good stories, though. I mean, you know, like I said, you just have to, have to remember all of them, yeah. you know? It's like one of those things that you got to sit down by the campfire and start having beers to be able to talk about that stuff because stuff just pops up every now and then when you're and thinking make, about and it. And make sure somebody's there to record it. Dude, for real. And that's that. me racing with Walker and uh, listening to all his stories back in the, the late late 80s. And, and that's what I used to say is, man, somebody needs to be writing this stuff down. And yeah. for now for 30 years I've been saying somebody needs to be writing all this stuff down. Yeah. And then yeah. I, nice thing about it is we have uh, a little bit more technology nowadays so i'm glad that you guys are both giving us the opportunity to be able to share some of these stories um so one of the things that i wanted to ask uh rob carl was uh his mount rushmore of off-road and uh, i mentioned to him you uh are also on my mount rushmore of off-road but he is as well do you have uh, a mount rushmore of off-road carl what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean like by Mount Rushmore? Like, what's your top dogs in off road to fill Mount Mount Rushmore? So, like, if I were to pick my Mount Rushmore of off road, it would be uh, yourself, uh, Rob, and, and a couple other guys. I was really a big fan of Evan Evans. Um, I would probably, oh, yeah. I would probably put Ivan Stewart up there. And how many uh, presidents are on Mount Rushmore? Five, four, I think. Four, yeah. So that would yeah. be that would be mine right there. So um, yeah. Do you know how off the cuff how who you'd put up there? Well, one hundred percent, Rob. I mean, there's there's no question. Um, you know, there's been a couple guys that that were that were important to me. Rod Millen was one of them. I really looked up to him, and he kind of 
took me under his wing and I, I really thought a lot of him. Um, I mean, who else? I mean, there's, there's Robbie Gordon, there's, um, you know, Walker Evans, of course. I mean, the, we can go all the way back, you know, Jimmy Johnson. I mean, there's, there's a lot of guys that are, that are phenomenal, you know, um, Frank Vessels. Remember him? Yep. I don't know who that is. Yeah. Scoop. Frank Scoop Vessels. Yeah. He was a BFG guy and yeah, an innovator at the time. He or? was a, uh, that too, but a, a, he drove class eight truck and yeah. I mean, he, I mean, he wasn't like, like winning a lot of races, but I, I just think he had some sort of impact, but I don't know. I would say for sure, Rob, uh, Rod Millen. And I would say Walker Evans. Yeah. Those are all good, man. Yeah. Uh, for, what do you think, Rob? I well, mean, yeah. is that, is that a, no, absolutely. Picture? It's funny. You said Rod Millen because in, in my Mickey Thompson years, um, I actually, when Walker Evans hired me in 89, I actually only made it a year and a half and I got fired, which honestly uh, was one of the best things that ever happened in my life from short course. So really? I sat out, but when I went back and sat in the grandstands, I realized, um, you know, Walker wasn't really helping me that much um, uh-huh. with my driving, but I ended up uh-huh. watching Rod Millen. And yeah. I said, once I sat out and started watching again, I'm like, I see what I'm doing wrong now. And uh, anyway, yeah. so I... I in short course racing, I looked up to Rod Millen like you're like you're saying, and then um, yeah. you know obviously in in the, the the short course like Lucas Oil that kind of stuff, you know yourself, you know everything, all the wins that you've done, and that's why I brought up the point earlier about I don't know has anyone else ever swept? I know I never did swept Pro Two and Pro Four in a weekend. It's quite likely that you're the only one that ever did that. Could, yeah. the, could that be true? Huh. And you probably did it more could than be. once. So you know. Yeah. Um, you know, you and I can't I, think of anybody either. No, I, I don't think anybody else did. I know I wanted to try, but <laughs> but um, you know, realizing it's hard. no, it's super so hard. Many and, guys, so many I, good guys. I bet Carl might have done it five times. Honestly, it seems to me like I don't know. You you Not did sure. it enough to to definitely make me to take notice and me to try it. And I know I never got one, yeah. but um, yeah. you know, and, and you're you and I when you retired, we were very close into the same amount of short course wins. And absolutely, t- today, identical. Yeah, exactly. And and right now, I think we're still quite a bit above anyone else i know kyle aduke yeah. probably just hit 100 total yeah. and then um but he also yeah do you know do you each know carl do you know how many wins you have altogether? um you know i don't know i, I like 125 maybe 124 something like that and rob do you remember it's it's somewhere similar to carl i think i got him by a little bit i he, he yeah. retired one year earlier yeah. i know when he was retiring we were super close you know they started nose and nose yeah, we talk were, about a privilege, man. Just think about how many wins we're talking to on the phone right now, Rob. No, well, just in short course, the the yeah. the Lucas Oil type short course between the two of us around two hundred and fifty. Holy yeah, right. smokes, so, man! Yeah, yeah. Good, <laughs> yeah. That's a lot. Good God, that is that is so cool, man. Uh, well, I know Carl, you got a lot of stuff uh, going on in your life right now. We really appreciate you calling in, man. It was fantastic Absolutely. to talk with you. We'd love yeah. to. Love um, me too. Maybe uh, get you on the show one of these days. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, I think you should. Yeah. Absolutely. It was, nice, uh, it was nice talking to you, Rob. I haven't talked to you probably since the last time we were at the race. Yep, likewise. We'll see you soon. That's awesome. See yeah, you, Crandon. And, and by, the, <laughs> by the way, uh, you know, I heard your son's really doing well. So congratulations. And yeah. Good luck with that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Kay- Caden is right. doing really well. That's awesome. We're going to actually talk about that a little bit, Carl. So thanks for giving us okay. a segue, right. brother. Have a good okay. one. Thanks, guys. Take care. We'll see you. Later, Carl. Bye. Man, it's so cool to to understand that. Like, Robert Blanton, when you, when you hear these guys talk with the amount of respect that they have towards each other, but the – amount of adrenaline over the years that they've spent on each other holy smokes dude can you imagine uh, it's it's cool you know me being relatively new to off-road um and when i stepped into off-road these carl and rob mack uh were the guys that we were all looking at yeah <clears throat> and now you know carl retired what three or four years ago um you know, sitting here with Rob Mack now and, you know, listening to these two guys talk, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, it's, it's awesome. 
it's awesome being here and experiencing that. I'm telling you, we were just talking about the pre-runner being like, uh, you know, how many stories it could tell. Can you imagine if we did actually have a camping trip and sit by the <laughs> by the fire with a couple beers, man? Just, yeah, add beer. Those well, stories will come out. <laughs> well, you know, get, and then get some of the older guys like Walker Evans and, you know, and, and love the opportunity f- for – for you know the the people that aren't here anymore like bruce myers who passed away this year um and just have them sit down and start talking about you know kind of pioneering all this stuff and and what it was like then to what it's like now you know you you were talking about needle valve shocks yeah what were those guys (laughs) dealing with back then you know it would it would be like it would probably be hard for some of us newbies to understand. You know I, I what have. I mean? It's a story that I realize it's been maybe 10 years ago. And uh, some kids that were 15, 16, 17 years old came up to me and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, Rob Mack signed my shirt and everything else. And how did you get started? And yeah. I was telling the story and I said, you know, I, I, and then I raced for Walker Evans and they said, who's Walker Evans? Yeah. And I realized, holy shit, you yeah. know, but that's the realization, you know, it's starting to happen to me now yeah. is there's, you know, as soon as I retire and you start not racing, you know, these young kids come up and they get involved in the sport and it's their passion and then they don't remember what happened. Dude, I can even take it up one notch. Like I was just interviewing uh, young kids at Four Wheel Parts. Um, Caden Danbury helped me co-host and Jacob Peter, which is a Polaris um, racer as well. Uh, both of them are young. They're under, I think they're 14, 13 years old. Um, but I said, who is your favorite driver? And they chose Seth Cantero, who's a baby compared to us. Like, yeah. I, it's like, to me, it's like the level, the, uh, the generations are, are so different. But it's so cool because you got to respect every single person coming through, right? Yep. Yeah. It, it's neat to see. Um, so John Lewis actually commented in and said, this is actually probably something that you can chime in on, Rob. Super Lights is where Jimmy Johnson uh, started. Then he drove the second truck for Nelson and Nelson with Rick Johnson. And I don't know what the Nelson and Nelson stuff is. Yeah, Nelson and Nelson, John Nelson, they were, they ran the Chevy team, and they were actually, you know, right now my race shop's in San Jacinto, and the Nelson Nelson shop was right over here in Hemet. We w- went to dinner a little bit ago, and I was showing you where the old Venable yep. shop is just a stone throw away from here is the old Venable shop that I raced for, 91 to 96. Um, Dave Westham ran out of here. Larry Miner's from here. There's some ties with Rod Hall. Like we said, Nelson and Nelson, um, and on and on. I think – you know, Hemet, San Jacinto area back in the day had a lot of the off-roaders coming from here. So, in that, and that last statements are true about Jimmy racing the Nature's Recipe Super Lights and then racing for Chevy Thunder, and that was his, that was his his way with Chevrolet into NASCAR. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Not very many people can say that they race against Jimmy Johnson. Yeah, yeah. so that's pretty neat. Uh, John Hubbard also said, "Is it better races in the states or in Mexico?" Um, you know, it's probably a preference, right? Well, I always love going to Mexico. You know, Baja's special. You know, Rob, you've been going to Nora, and and it's a special place. And I think you know, forever and always, that'll that'll be my favorite. Um, you know, there's there's good races in in the states too. I used to love racing the old Barstow tracks, and you know, we had multiple roads next to each other. I love Parker. Um, you know, there's I I love racing anywhere and everywhere, but Baja is definitely at the top of my list. I, I think a better question is like, what do you prefer? Desert racing or short course? That's always been a tough one. You know, yeah. somebody always said, you know, if you had to choose which one did you do, well, um, you know, it, with my racing career, I always had to go out and solicit funding and, and sell sponsorship. And the easiest way for me to sell sponsorship was for short course racing. Yeah. So, and that short course racing helped get my desert program started. So, it was always tough for me to choose because I wanted to say desert, but I knew, you know, my bread and butter was with the short course. Um, you know, now things are changing a little bit and, you know, ultimately if I look back at it, you know, the, the, uh, experiences that the desert racing give you, you know, whether it's pre-running in Baja or, you know, the longer races, the more time, you know, um, desert racing is, is definitely, you know, as, as I get older and I look back, desert racing, is really where it's at for me. It's really from all the memories and the stories. But less helmet head in short course <laughs> racing. You got better True. hair coming out of the car, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. I, you know, and I always say that, you know, short course is more fan friendly. Um, it, it's it's a one to two day event where desert racing can be drawn you know, out. Yeah. Through it, right. And if you wad up big time in short course, safety's right there. Yeah. yeah. And you're getting towed off the track. You're getting brought back to your pit area, you know, you load up yep. and you figure out what went wrong. Open desert racing, 
Yeah. You but I think you could go both, like teeter-totter on both of that, because that means um, when I'm listening to you say this, I'm thinking, wow, desert racing is really hard then because you're so uh, out there. You're doing it all on your own, right? And then, But the short course is also a little bit more intense. So you could go back and forth. All the- Well, uh, you know, Warfighter Made doesn't desert race like Rob Mack desert races, <laughs> right? But every time we go out there, it's, you know, because we're going so slow, you, we get a second to break focus and look around, right? You're going fast enough to make a big old angry dude throw up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And a shout out to the Manx clubs. There, there's the guys out there in the Super Manx is that uh, that uh, we ended up finishing ahead of them. Um, how, I still don't know. But uh, out of 100 vehicles, we finished 42nd overall, starting 87th. And, um, you know, those guys would always like, every time we either had to come up behind you to pass or saw you in our, our mirrors, we were like, oh, God, how is this Humvee even anywhere near <laughs> us? You know, to- total uh, confidence sapping, you know, whatever. And we we're like, oh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. So when I was fixing the audio, were you guys talking about you going down to Nora then, Rob? Yeah, a little bit. I, I keep saying, you know, Racing for me uh, has turned into, you know, pretty uh, intense job. at times. It's, intense, it's a job, yeah. you know. I, you know, I know sponsors and people expect me to win. And back in the day, you know, come home from a race, they didn't win. And my friends, you know, they'd bust my chops. And what do you mean you didn't win? So yeah. I put a lot of that pressure on myself too. And I, I can't wait. You know, I keep saying I want to go to Nora. I want to go race that because, you know, at the end of the day, I want to have a beer, you know, and go the next day. Well, right now it doesn't seem like that's possible. But, you know, I've been telling Rob for – or thinking about it for – probably almost two years now. Like I know they've been going. It's like when I go, I'm going to help them. So that would be pretty cool. You know, you know, one of the cool things for, for me personally and for Warfighter made is, you know, you have one of the, the winningest off-road drivers in history. Well, Lindsay Geyser said it great this morning. She said the goat, the goat, you got the goat right here. And he comes out to one of our events. He's, you know, driving his Polaris razor, uh, And he comes up to me afterwards, and he's just like, I had a really good time. I forgot how fun off-road can be. Dude, that's so rad. You know, so I'm like, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I'm drying my eyes. I'm like, (laughs) I'm never going to forget this, Rob. (laughs) And, uh, you know, but but now it's like, you know, you pioneer, I mean, you, you made this sport, you've carried it this far into, um, you know, where we are now. You know, come with us and have some fun. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm all about it. Let's have some fun. And and any vets that are out there watching this right now, or listening to this, or or seeing this later, that's what Warfighter Made is all about. You know, we take all vets, all branches, all eras. Uh, we have Polaris Razors uh, to do adrenaline therapy Saturdays with, but we also we we have quickly become known as the military uh, vehicle race guys, and. Um, and we have a whole host of vehicles that we like to do either short course or desert races with. And uh, we just so happen to, to, you know, been pretty lucky at it and, and doing, doing well and having a ton of fun. Have you ever driven a Humvee? Rob? No, I have yeah. not. Yeah. So, <laughs> hey, look. You, he'd get in and he'd be like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is so underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty cool to see, though. At yeah. least to get a picture of him in the yeah. seat, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just pretend. Well, I tell you, this, this last ATS that we just did this uh, on the 8th of uh, May, uh, I got to give a ride in Beefy, our Humvee, named after uh, Angus Beefy Powers, who passed away last year. Um I got to give a Korean War vet and a Vietnam vet, Marine, a ride in Beefy. And uh, he's got stage four cancer, and he knows he's on his way out. And he's just trying to pack as much fun into, you know, what remaining time he has left. And uh, his grandson posted a video, and he's just smile ear to ear. And I'm doing a whopping 30 miles an hour around the track because it can't go any faster. And, you know, so it's stuff like that. And then we got to celebrate a 61st birthday with a lady who's never done anything like that. And uh, her son-in-law is a veteran and, and, uh, you know, got to give her a ride on her 61st birthday. And she loved it. So, Dude, that's fantastic. I mean, like how many people ask you, dude, can you just take me for a ride in a truck? You know what I mean? And they're actually doing stuff similar, at least, you know, on a different level, but it's cool. And Kane Danbury uh, got to give a 91-year-old lady a ride (laughs) in his 
uh, razor. And apparently, you know, he was doing the, hey, if you're good, keep the thumbs up. Or if you want to go faster, give me a thumbs up. And if something's wrong, just give me a thumbs down. I guess she was like this the whole time. <laughs> the whole time. Like, <laughs> go faster. Go faster. Go faster. Quit so. being a little sissy. Take me on a real ride. Uh, uh, that's cool. Kane's uh, my man. And then uh, Scott Rand just commented in and said, uh, how about Rob giving Johnny Greaves his first ride in Class 4 Pro 4? You remember that? I'm trying to remember. Oh, okay. So I, he actually, at first I was thinking he actually rode with me. No, that's not what happened. Right, Scott? I, th- I think what you're referring to is the first race um, in, uh, it wasn't this truck. It was, a, it was a different 1996. I think it was an Ortho Lawn and Garden sponsored truck. And it was a brand new truck, came last minute. Uh, to the racetrack in Lake Geneva, and I ended up endowing it. I thought, uh, no test time, no shock tuning, no nothing. I think I started fourth. I came around, I was in second place, and I thought to myself, I could win this thing with no test time, and I ended up endowing it, hurt my back, and then uh, we were actually sharing a shop with Johnny Greaves and ended up uh, asking Johnny if he would drive my Pro 4 um, oh. the next day. So, And Johnny did. So, Dude, the off-road community coming yeah. again. But what's rad is, is that you have – viewers and listeners that are so into the dirt life yeah. that this is stuff that in, impacts them and, you know, they want to know about. That's awesome. Dude, I, the I memories, like, um, I know who Scott is, but, like, the memories that these guys have, I mean, like, I'm learning, right? Like like Rob said, we're kind of newbies in the, in the scheme of things sitting next to you, but um, the memories that I have are very vivid, and these people have just as much or more. Yeah. Like it's pretty rad. So what's the, what's this comment here? I know uh, the reason I want you to ask this one, Rob, is because you guys share a sponsor. Love that new paint scheme, Rob. You know <laughs> he's he's running the uh, BF Goodrich uh, truck now, and uh, it does. It's a it's a phenomenal looking. You know we we share. We share a sponsor with BFG. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've been with BF Goodrich since 1991. So. Yeah, and this year um, the truck was all black, and and it's like we got to do something special, and ended up, uh, you know, looking at BF Goodrich. Who doesn't love red, white, and blue, yeah, man? Absolutely, like, it it does look pretty sick. And uh, so some of the stuff I was looking for some pictures uh, when we were doing your guys' intro, and uh, some of the pictures that uh, are from the San Felipe 250, uh, the truck looks really good. Like just the black doesn't look that good in the dust, but yeah. the white, red, white, and blue, yeah. like you can see it through the dust and stuff. It looks awesome. Yeah, man. definitely got a lot of good comments. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's see here. Uh, we got a couple other comments, but. Uh, but desert requires uh, a bigger crew uh, and becomes much bigger a uh, family. Well, I don't know about the family portion of it, but the crew does. Well, you know, and, and for the Nora, we went down with six people, Right. period. Four vets that were that Are we shared. calling this skeleton crew? It, well, yeah, because we've gone down before with tons of people. Uh, we did 20-something people one time when we had two vehicles for the 50th anniversary of the Nora. But this time we went down with, with uh, a total of six people, four vets, two chase, and we had a great time. I mean, it really was a perfect amount of people for, for what it was. Can you give us a comparison? How many people do you take to a, uh, like I said, to say a Peninsula run, and then how many do you take to a Crandon? Uh, peninsula run, we've had a little over 100 people. Wow. And the reason for that is, um, you know, when – Typically, a peninsula run lately has been uh, over a thousand miles, so we'll pit six times. And each one of those fuel pits has to be um, separate; they can't be the same people. Okay. So pretty much have about fifteen people in each of those pits. And yeah. then chase trucks, uh, the trophy trucks keep getting faster and faster. So the chase trucks down the highway, they have a hard time keeping up. So, you need so, more. so I, yes, yeah, so we need more. And I've kind of stationed or divide up the race into three sections. I have the top, you know third yeah. you know yeah. that chase guys there and then in the middle and then at the end so we've been ended up having the last few peninsula runs over 100 people whereas in short course racing with one truck we may have you know eight or 10 or 12 people um so definitely a different amount of people yeah, yeah. that's a, that is a much much bigger difference so david is actually pretty right um i don't know what stetson said but uh meant by this but said dvr in the house so, oh, DV- so- dvr is desert vets racing okay. they're a uh, another nonprofit that takes vets puts them in as passengers and they ra- they race uh really all kinds of races uh a lot of the local district type races but they were just out at the uh the clear uh what was the 300 that just happened oh silver state the silver state yeah, yeah. they just ran the silver state so right on do you have any uh intentions of doing any uh best in the desert stuff or no um this year there's nothing on the schedule okay. for me at this point just doing the score stuff man or no uh, mint possibly it's right after the ball 1000. So just see how we'll things just go. F- see how things go. We're still at this, 
you know, with last year with COVID and everything, the direction was, hey, I was doing these races, and then in the end didn't do some of them, did other ones. And this year, so far, things are kind of staying in line, and we'll see if that all happens. But uh, right now the plan is doing the score races, and we'll we'll talk about the Mint later in the year. It's so close yeah. to the 1,000. Um, with the same truck, it'd just about be impossible. It's crazy how 2021, everything's so staggered yeah. and scattered around. Um, and Jacob Delter, um, sorry, bud, we've uh, been talking so much, but he actually asked, uh, is there any 2021 short course plans? Come out, champ. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, – we actually, we sold the two Pro 2s, still have the Pro 4 here. Um, you know, and I've been eyeing up the, the Midwest Series back there. There's definitely a lot of good things happening back there. Um, they'll be on TV this year. Um you know, and uh, we'll see what happens. It should be pretty cool, man. I would love to see you back on a short course track. So um, it's uh, there's a couple comments that are coming in. I'm going to go uh, – maybe you could take this one with Scott Wren, but uh, John Huppert's asked, uh, the most dangerous part of being in Baja is watching out for all the chase drivers. <laughs> more, more people, more chasers die in Baja than the racers do, Yeah, without a What's doubt. What's the reason for that? That seems weird. It, it's just – well, first of all, there's more of them, right? Right. You know, uh, in numbers, and then two. You know, these guys are are they're they're pushing quote unquote just as hard, but the focus isn't there. You know. Oh, because they're thinking about something else. You, you, well, I mean, they're they're on a f- asphalt road, and by the way, it, the uh, Baja. Well, you were just down in San Felipe. Yeah. Baja, all the roads down there, Highway yeah. One is all paved now, and it's just so amazing. Um, or three or whatever that is. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but more, ch- more chasers lose their life down there than, uh, the racers do. We could get into all those stories about safety and stuff, but I'm just going to say I'm a big proponent of safety. So if anybody has any, uh, uh, suggestions, please tell the race organizers because we, we could definitely use some more safety. Well, I'll tell you the other thing too, is that the roads are significantly more narrow down there. And so when you're, you know, chasing and you have a trailer, Another vehicle's coming at you, whether it be a, a local semi truck or just another chase truck or whatever. There's not really room to move to the right when you're passing each other. So sometimes, well, like a true single lane road, it is a true single. And then for whatever reason, Mexico or Baja likes to put these concrete pillars <laughs> right on the side of the road. And uh, my biggest fear has always been, especially towing a trailer, either getting too far off the road and catching the rear of the trailer on one of those concrete pillars or, you know, having a, a big rig catch the other side of the trailer. Yeah. Right. You know, it's, 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 uh, you know, you gotta be on your A game when you're down there. You, you learn to know how to whip the trailer around the yeah, semi. Like you do. You really semi's do. coming the other way. You do the whip. You really <laughs> or you do. got the concrete so post on the right. The right oh, yeah. <laughs> the farther you get south, and and over time, all the years I've been going, the road keeps getting a little better, a little better, a little better. But yeah. those concrete posts that you're alluding to, those used to be the white the white line, which there a long time ago there was no lines, they yeah. didn't paint any lines. So now they have the lines, but in the concrete posts were actually right there on the side of the road, like Ugh. really close. So dude, that's crazy. Take out an axle, and then you start learning don't drive at night because yeah. the, you know the donkeys and the cows come out onto the roads at night, and and also the the eighteen wheelers they kind of own the roads yeah. at night and stuff, and it's. So you learn a lot of that stuff. So Scott also commented in, uh, we're going to go to a commercial break in about 10 minutes here. So, uh, But let's answer uh, Scott what he was talking about a story here. He said, what about the pro buggy days um, Ro- where Rob was forced to start last? What, what was that all about? Well, well, that's okay. So that's a good story. Um, ha- well, so- let me finish what he said real quick. <laughs> okay. But, uh, and then has the lead at the Comp Yellow again, uh, was forced to go back to last at Comp Yellow and still won in the days of 30-plus cars. Uh, Jim Baldwin loved Rob. Yeah. So, um, sorry, go so earlier on the show we told you about in 2001 I got the letter from Marty Reed saying my truck's illegal so I didn't race short course all the way until um 2007 and I was starting to miss it well I did go when Jim Baldwin invited me back I did go to Chula Vista one weekend but I started missing it again between say 2004 and 2007 I started missing it and I'm like I got to do something at that time John Cooley was building me the buggy that my pre-run buggy and I kept going to my like, Hey, you need to, you need to look into building these super buggies. And he's like, ah, I don't have time for that. Well, one day he called me up. He goes, well, would you do a beam or a arm? And I go, I don't know. Let me think about it. So we kept talking about it, finished my buggy. And one day he called and said, Hey, you need to come down and look at my super buggy. And I'm like, Oh shit. You know, I, I didn't want one. He goes, no, no, it's mine. I'm building it. So I ended up going down there and looking at it. And I ordered one. Cause I said, this is my way to get back into short course racing. And, um, we're, 
getting it built. It was about uh, two thirds of the way done. I got a phone call from Steve Barlow at, the, at that time was running a Red Bull Pro 2. And he said, hey, I was talking to BF Goodrich, Frank D'Angelo, and they said you've been wanting to get back into it. Are you interested? And I said, heck yeah. You know, I, I go, I'm building the super buggy right now. And would you mind if I, can I drive the buggy and the Pro 2 at the same time? And he goes, no, no problem. So I go, count me in. He says, okay, I'll get back to you. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from, uh, from uh, Core and they said, uh, hey, um, we received your super buggy entry and also pro two entry. You can't race a pro class and super buggy at that time. It wasn't a pro class. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. Like I've got this money invested in the super buggy and now it's not even done and it's worth, you know, I got to yeah. sell it and I can't do it. Where and, am I going to put it? Yeah. Yeah. Because, it, and back to saying again, the name used to be super buggy. It was not a professional class. And I'm like, Oh my God, what do I got myself into? So I ended up, I was in Baja pre-running when I got the news and I said, I'm calling Jim Baldwin because you know, I don't, this, this ain't right. I'm pissed. And they, I called the office and the secretary said, he's in a meeting right now. I said, you tell him I want to talk to him. <laughs> she goes, I can't. He's in a meeting right now. I go, you tell him I want to talk to him right now. So he got on the phone and we chatted and he, he was yelling at me and he goes, you don't need to be in a buggy. And I'm like, I'll tell you what. I go, you take my entry. You take me out of that pro two. I'm driving that super buggy. He slammed the phone down about a week later. He called me and he says, okay, I fixed the problem. We're going to call it Pro Buggy now. Oh, <laughs> perfect. So he let me do it, and I was racing Pro Buggy and Pro 2, and at that time I had a newer Illumicraft car, and we were doing really well. And he said, Rob, you're stinking up the show. <laughs> he goes, you got to start at the back. And I said, okay, that's, that'll be fun for me. And uh, so I started, started in the back at the beginning, and we'd get all the way through, and we'd win. And he said, okay, that's it, Rob. He goes, you start at the back at the beginning, and at the halfway yellow, you're going to the back again. I'm so, ah, let's try it. Well, I couldn't win anymore, but I was still having fun, grinning and stuff. And we were at Chula Vista at the quarry down there, and um, I remember finishing in the, in the buggy and uh, put it away, and I was running back up to the grandstands to watch the Pro 4 race because I was only racing Pro 2 and, and the Pro Buggy at the time. And as I was going up the stairs, uh, Greg Aronson and Ron Fleming from Fat Performance, they did my motors, and they were coming down, and I'm like, hey, what's happening? And they go, uh, not much. We didn't win. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> they did my motors. Yeah. And I continued walking up the stairs, and I went straight to Jim Baldwin. I said, we can't do this anymore. He goes, no, that was the best thing ever. I go, no, you don't understand. I have partners and people that are helping me so that I can win and help them win and do their help their, sell their products. So from that point on, um, you know, I think I only raced uh, – you know, maybe that rest that season and it was over. But it's anyways, pretty, good times. It's a pretty hardcore situation at the time for you when you're walking up and you have to talk with all these people. But that's another thing that changed the face of the short course racing. You know, yeah. like that that literally made changes to have the what you see nowadays. Absolutely. That's pretty cool. Scott well, Rain, awesome question, man. Yeah. Uh, all, the, all the buggies before that were beam cars. Yeah. And uh, for most of them. I mean, there's very few A-arm cars. And, um, and when John Cooley Illumicraft did that, basically now all the – the pro buggies are AM cars, yeah. almost all of them. It's so crazy how times change and how just things progress. Um, hey, so we're going to take a quick commercial break. We got a bunch of questions or as comments that come in. Troy, we're going to answer yours in just a little bit. And uh, after the break, we're going to play Are You Smarter Than a Third Grader with these guys. So Instagram Live, you guys keep hanging on, and uh, we'll be right back.
Shock Therapy, the premier UTV suspension tuning company. We test daily with the leading manufacturers in the industry to perfect our shock tunes and race proven components for all UTVs. Whether it's high speed racing or slower trails, we have a suspension tune that is perfect for your driving style. Visit shocktherapist.com to improve your ride today. Zollinger Racing builds the best aftermarket products available, products for your UTV or snowmobile, including billet radius rods, billet tie rods, billet steering knuckles, billet steering racks, alternator kits, and much more. All manufactured in the United States in-house at their headquarters in Nibley, Utah. Travis Zollinger and his team test in some of the most brutal conditions, racing in places like the Best in the Desert Mint 400, Ultra 4 King of the Hammers, off your next purchase, and join us on social media at Zollinger Racing Products to see our products in action. Zollinger Racing, the best products, period. Yeah, finally, we got Lance from Solderweld in the studio. Oh. Thanks for coming down, bud. Hey, why don't we just record a commercial now? Yeah, why not? So good to be here, man. It's been a lot. I've been trying to get down here forever, uh, and uh, I wanted to talk about the off-road kit. Dude, I love those things. I got it in uh, my pack. Yeah, we're running uh, hundreds of uh, vehicles now running them, whether it's a UTV or some guy's got it in a backpack and was motocross. He's got uh, everything he needs to make a fix right there on the fly, out on the trail, uh, or in the desert, whatever it is. Well, since I've already used one, I kind of know what to use it for, but uh, explain what it does. All right, so let's pull one out real quick. You've got your aluminum rods. Remember, they're rods. Right, so uh, you know, light torch, small torch. You can uh, throw it in there or throw it on the rig with your flux. It decontaminates and cleans like a, let's say, a radiator. You get a random rock chip runs through uh, as you're racing. You get a rock chip in a radiator. You got to fix it right there, or you're yep. out of the race. You can patch it up instead of you can of patch it up, Bill. And then uh, your hop lock, heat absorption putty. So it yep. keeps you from getting burned, number one, as well as keeps the heat from traveling. So uh, it's really, uh, really nice. I've used this not even to fix anything. So it's, that stuff works <laughs> it's, so good, man. Listen, it's easy. It's uh, It straps in nicely so that you uh, have everything you need in one little place. And you don't have to carry a big bag in it's the It's like a uh, first truck. aid uh, kit for your vehicle. Yeah, chase trucks have it as well so that, uh, you know, if they need to make a fix on the fly, they can get it done and get it done quick and get you back in the race. Dude, those things are so cool. All right, so it's at Solderweld on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, SolderWeld.com. Awesome. All right, thanks, bud. Appreciate it. Yeah, we are back. Thank you guys uh, again for joining us on episode 84 of the Dirt Live Show. We got our featured guest, Rob Max, sitting right here to my left. We got Robert Bland from Warfighter Maid sitting to my far left. Um, this has been an awesome show so far. Story time with the Robs has not disappointed. That's for dang sure. Uh, but we're going to stop doing stories for five or ten minutes, and we're going to do a battle royale. Are you smarter than a third grader? Are you guys ready for this? No. no. <laughs> yeah, okay. I already know the answer. Rob, <laughs> absolutely Rob, no. Rob Mack wants to go back to story time. <laughs> story time. <laughs> uh, so uh, you guys would have had an advantage if you saw the last episode of the Dirt Live show with Caden Danbury, who is a, a very big proponent of Are You Smarter Than a Third Grader, and uh, with Jacob Peter, because these are the same questions. I was, oh. too, I was too lazy to find other Man. ones. So uh, you could have got all the answers already. Um, all right. We're going to get straight into it. No, no sin at the starting line waiting for Best in the Desert. Uh, the first Thanksgiving was celebrated by Native Americans and what other group of people? Pilgrims. <laughs> okay. Rob got it. Pilgrims. Uh, Which Rob? <laughs> you, okay, I'll, we'll just go by last name. Uh, all right. Blanton got it. All right. So he's off to a good start. He's got a whole shot. Uh, the, oh, look at him. <laughs> uh, question number two. Name the American president on the half-dollar coin who was assassinated in 1963. Would it be Kennedy? Kennedy. Yeah. yeah. I got to say, McCachron got it on that one. Yeah. All right. So I think all, he was helping me out on that one. <laughs> all, all tied up one-to-one -one right there. Uh, okay, cool. So uh, question number three. Here we go. What is the name – of the book about a friendship between a spider. Winnie the Pooh. Oh, close. <laughs> Charlotte's Web. 
Hi, I didn't even finish the question. He's How many books are about spiders <laughs> and, and a pig? And a, and yeah. a pig named Wilbur, Charles <laughs> Webb. All right, Land gets that one, so <laughs> two to one so far. All right. Believe it or not, I read <laughs> when I was a kid. <laughs> question number four, uh, and this one stumped me. So uh, what's the name of a body of land that is completely surrounded by water? An island. Uh, got that? Okay. That so, stumped you? Like, what? that's probably the only one on the whole thing I'll get. <laughs> when I, <laughs> that's, is that the answer? <laughs> so now I look like a complete ass. We're just going to skip over it. I'm going to go on question number five. It's, it's called the Hawaiian <laughs> Islands for a reason. <laughs> All right, question number five here. Uh, what is the capital of New York? New York. Oh, close. I, a couple people have answered that, but it's not New York. It starts with an A and ends with... Albany. <laughs> Albany. Oh. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so it's Albany. Uh, All right. Good job, Blaine. It ends with Albany. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Blaine, you got it. All right. Well, you guys were sitting there for too long. I was like, right, we can't have dead air for that long. Uh, question you know, number I, I, I just ran into my old report cards. <laughs> oh, really? They weren't very good. <laughs> yeah. That's I, was, okay. I was drawing race cars. Yeah. Dude, that's funny that you say that because uh, when I was going, to school, I was always drawing little uh, dirt bikes. Like, hey, quit looking at the answers over here, champion. <laughs> He's got to be a champ in everything he hey, does. <laughs> so pre pre running and looking and reading the questions. How about that? Uh, okay, question number six here. What is the closest planet to the sun? Mercury. Dude, dude, you like you studied up. I got kids, man. Well, actually, my youngest is 23, so. <laughs> That's really... not even close to third grade, dude. <laughs> uh, all right, so question number seven. What is, and by the way, um, the funnest game, Are You Smarter Than the Third Grade, that I've ever played is was with uh, Ronnie and RJ Anderson. That was a good one. I remember that, that one. That competitive spirit that they had was off the chain, man. It was so good. Um, all right. Um, what is H2O also known as? Water. Water. Uh, I'm going to give it to him. Thank he, you. Give it to him because he's so far behind right now. <laughs> uh, what is the score? Do you remember? know how many points you have? Four? No. Okay. No. I think you have four. Something to zip. Uh, <laughs> solve this equation. Three plus two divided by one equals five. Five. Oh, math guy over here. So yeah. we need more math questions. No, no, That's yeah, how we no. do it. No Matt, more for me. That's like timing. Like, <laughs> yeah. So when I'm racing and they're giving me splits, what, were you, were I have you, to like figure that out. Yeah, you could figure it out super quick. Were you good <laughs> in, in school? What was your favorite subject? There was none. Recess? Was, yeah, leaving. <laughs> Getting out of there and going to do whatever you wanted yeah. to do. Um, all right. We I only should got to my lip on that. Tell them what happened <laughs> in school. That's not a good role. Not a good school role model. Who invented the light bulb in 1879? Thomas Edison. Uh, that was a good one. He he thought of it at the same time you just spoke before him. So yeah. uh, okay, a gallon of water. Uh, Eight pounds. Dude, it's more than gas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much is a gallon we were, of gas? We were actually like just six point six, I think. Is it was it? Fun, we were just talking about that yesterday. Um, if a dog jumps in the water and gets saturated, does it get heavier as it's running around? I would assume so, right? Like your truck has mud on it kind of thing? I guess so. I don't know. We never figured it out. But we're like, well, water weighs eight pounds. So, so you, yeah. So you know, you know why I know that? Why? It's because I used to race a limited class and it had a minimum weight. Oh. So when you get to the finish line and you burn stuff off, your car's got to make weight. My cars are always very, very close. close. Yep. And um, so I learned that if you – if you do well and they soak you with water, it saturates in the seat, and then the car gets a little heavier because nice. the water. Ooh. So hey, there you go. I don't race limited cars anymore. Ra racing tips <laughs> by Rob Mack. Yeah, exactly. We used to measure fuel and do all that stuff, but nothing like the water, man. That's a pretty good one. I never did that. That's <laughs> never, a ever. good one. Um, what is the primary difference between ocean water and tap water? Solidity, the salt. Yeah, so it's third grader, so it's salt. Uh, what is the freezing point of water? 32. Thirty-two degrees. Oh, I'm giving it to Rob Mack. You got to uh, give. If I'm even close, you give it to me. Thanks. <laughs> no problem, dude. We got you covered over here. Uh, Remember, I gave you. I gave you a dollar. To yeah. <laughs> dude, apparently we're surrounded by a genius with Blanton yeah. over here. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. With third grade questions. <laughs> if you were asking fourth grade questions, I'd be freaking drooling on myself right now. Oh, here we go. 
This is a, a kind of a racing question because it has to do with uh, coming over jumps and stuff. What is the force that causes objects to fall to the ground? Gravity. Gravity. Boom. Got it. Uh, okay. What is the capital of Nevada? Uh, Las Vegas. No. No. <laughs> well, that pretty much is what everybody Carson thinks City. about. Yeah, Carson City. So nobody knows what the capital of Las Vegas is. I don't even think – I don't know what New York's was either. Um, in what country is the famous Taj Mahal located? India. Yeah, got it. I think you guys tied. We're going to call it Perfect. a tie. Um, so next time, I'm buying tacos since you guys tied. Uh, so that was pretty fun, though. I always think those third grader questions are super cool because it at least gets a little bit of ice broken and a little bit of competitive spirit on the set. So I'm Rob, glad that Rob you guys pissed were... me off. Rob, <laughs> I'm so pissed right now. He's fired up. <laughs> uh, He's like, you know what? Get in a freaking vehicle right now. <laughs> yeah. Let's see who wins if I get a steering wheel, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, so Troy uh, commented in and said, hi, guys. I'm from Wisconsin and love the short course tracks and have never been to a desert race. Which one would you recommend as a must-see event? Well, that's a loaded question because you're not at you're you're talking to Baja guys right here, and you might only be able to go to the United States. I don't know what. Well, what mint. Yeah, I think the mints the mints the no-brainer because uh, traveling into Vegas, the amenities there, um, they have uh, you know tech and contingency downtown sometimes for two days, oh, so yeah. um, a lot easier to to see it, figure it out, and get more more the, out of it. The mint four hundred definitely. Yeah, and uh, yeah, three and a half lane wide. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike Gilson commented in and said, "Hate to ask, but how many bystanders get in the uh, get hit in the desert?" Um, oh, I think he's talking about the people like trying to film and do all that stuff. I don't, I don't it's know. Been a while. It's, I, I think it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, it's been a little while. So, you know, it's it's definitely the fans in Baja. Um, there's no rules. Yeah, there's no rules. There, there's you know, we're racing. You know, San Felipe was just a. I think it was. A, 280 mile loop and you know there's there's no fence they can go watch anywhere they want but uh you know and they're fanatics down there so they they want to see it feel it hear it you know um they're the you know we're we as off-road racers that we're the the only live sport they don't have professional you know basketball baseball stuff like that in Baja right and uh so we're the biggest thing they see and yeah it's the big show yeah we, yeah we the the drivers, the the Robbie Gordons and Ivan Stewart's Walker in Baja, they're like gods, you yeah. know, and and uh, all up and down the peninsula, it's an amazing thing. So, but I, yeah, I, I, I'll tell you though, you know, obviously, whenever you see a trophy truck or a trick truck or whatever you know you call it at that point, the locals are losing their minds. Right. In my opinion, the next most popular vehicle down there is Class 11. Yeah, the yeah. Volkswagens. They love the Volkswagens. And my homie Danny Navo and I got to drive the Mag 7 Class 11 in the Mexican 1000 in 2019. Mm -hmm. And you would have felt we were like rock stars. Yep. They, they wanted to come up and, and talk to you. And, and it was more than just asking for stickers, right? It was – they they – were it, 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 you feel like a rock star. at that point you it really becomes do. relatable though because it's a, it's just have you ever driven a class 11 Rob? no no i haven't <laughs> would you like to because i don't know how my back would feel man. highly no. <laughs> recommend it it was yeah. so much fun your speed is relative to your suspension travel oh, okay it is so much fun that would be kind of cool. So then. much fun if you do drive one rob take me yeah let's I'll, do it i'll go with you <laughs> um and uh John, yeah, I don't want to talk too much about that safety stuff. Like, all the safety stuff, I'm a big proponent of safety, like I said before. So, if you're out there on the course, please be careful. Without a doubt. Um, David says, uh, you should have heard uh, Jim on the radio for that Chula Vista race. And so, he's talking about one of your guys? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, maybe it was a Chula Vista Jim race. Jim Baldwin, maybe? Yeah, yeah probably maybe. talking about Jim Baldwin. Yeah, I, w I was. Oh yeah, on. here we go. Yeah, so you should have heard uh, Jim Baldwin screaming over the uh, over the radio. Scott said, um, Don Haugen said, if Texplex brings Pro Two and Pro Four next year to Texas, uh, I don't know if they could do that out there, man. They'd have to do some serious track changes. Um, would you come? Uh, they are doing a mod carts series this summer. I mean, that actually sounds interesting, but I think it would be quite a bit of work for them to do that. Yeah, I haven't been been to uh, Texplex. I've heard about it. You, it. you were there, and I've. It's a little too motocrossy yeah. for a big truck, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for the UTVs, it's right at the edge of being too much. But they they basically made news because they were offering that big payout, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, they are actually doing a pretty good job, though. And the way that they do it, it's really structured like a motocross race. You right. know, I actually think Caden would like to go out there, man. He'd probably have a, your son would probably have a really good a good time out there. He's such a good UTV driver, and his control of the car is so nice that he'd be uh, able to time a lot of those jumps really right. well. Um, shoot, maybe you'd even have a good time in a UTV out there. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think that's more of a, a loaded question, Don. Uh, I appreciate you asking though, because that's pretty cool that they're even thinking about it. Um, shoot, there's not really any short course racing in the center of the country like that, is there? Just the stuff they're doing in the Midwest. So it... Yeah, so that's actually, um, Frank Hahn commented in. What does he say about Amber here? <laughs> Rob, Blanton? Oh, he, he, he wants to oh. go to Fiji. Yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. If everyone gets married, he wants to go to Fiji too. Frank. Oh, so he's talking about the story with yeah. uh, Renna Zetters and everybody? Yep. Uh-huh. Frank, Frank's related to Carl. <laughs> yeah, well, I, who doesn't want to go to Fiji, though, right? We're in, Frank. Set it up. <laughs> <laughs> You're already ready to go? <laughs> Bags are packed. Yeah. Swim, swim trunks are set up. Look, look at John Lewis is trying to call me out. Blanton watched the show last week and studied all the answers. Oh, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> John, just because you're a Rob Mack fan doesn't mean <laughs> that other people can be smarter than a third grader, okay? <laughs> uh, okay, and then uh, Mike Gilson commented in and said, ask Rob how many uh, cobs of corn uh, can Rob eat at a corn roast. <laughs> oh, there must be a backstory behind this one. My first year back there racing, and it was soda then before core, and we stayed. When you say it, back there, where are you talking? In about? Wisconsin, and uh, in the Midwest. And first year we traveled back there to go race, and we stayed at Johnny Greaves' shop, and we were looking for a place to test. We were struggling with the truck, and Johnny said, um, "You know, just go down, you know, through the fields and turn left and turn right, and we're in the middle of corn all around us, and." there was a little place where the water would run and the corn wouldn't grow. So we ended up making a little test track. And one day we're out there testing and, and Mike Gilson, Mikey, we call him or the corn boy. And the reason why he's <laughs> named the corn boy is because um, as we're testing, we thought we were in the middle of nowhere and he was about 14 years old, I think. And he came walking out of the corn and we're like, where did you come from? Children, so, children, of, children the corn. of the corn. <laughs> yeah, he was exactly. So, um, you know, Mikey ended up being part of the team and we ended up traveling around with us to the country. And w- when we go back at Crandon, like this year and last year, we went back there and we had him come out and help us. So he knows a lot of these stories as well. That's pretty cool. How would you like having the nickname the Corn Boy? Though, yeah. <laughs> you still call him that when yeah, you see him. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the Corn Man now. He's, he's a Corn Man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, can you read this one uh, for us, Rob, real quick? Uh, Robert Blanton. Oh. Hey, Carl said to go uh, to a live audience that he'd take us to Fiji. Yeah. <laughs> There's proof. There is proof. So it sounds like Amber's uh, trying to get to Fiji now, yeah, too. Someone's going to Fiji. So maybe when you get back home, <laughs> your bags are going to be packed and ready to rip. Yeah, bags are packed. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Um, hey, Carl said it in the live audience. Yeah. Uh, and Robert Hargis said, uh, killed me at KOH last year seeing the star logo covered on uh, – covered in tape uh so rad the bfg stepped in it really is cool to see the um the stuff that happens behind the scenes is um we're not going to get too far into it but is always business oriented no matter what happens you see really see the cream rise to the top the people that care about racing the people that support racing and the people that support the families drivers and staff and everybody that that does race so uh i'm really glad that bf goodrich stepped up to support your program man it's fantastic to see a company sticking by the people that they care about yeah they're they've been good to me since 1991 uh, we've been together and uh, done a lot of things together, won a lot of races together, you know, developed a lot of tires. And, um, you know, I appreciate everything they've done for me. And, you know, the truck, you know, in these colors and everything looks awesome. Got a lot of a lot of great compliments. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, <laughs> John Lewis commented and said, I'm also a Robert Blanton fan as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever run, uh, John Huppert said, have you ever run at the ERX Motor Park up there in Minnesota? No, I, I haven't. I've seen uh, videos and stuff like that. And it looks it like a pretty pretty cool track. It does look pretty insane. What's, and What's your favorite short course track? Um, up Crandon, obviously. Is, okay, Crandon doesn't exist. What's your yeah. number two? Number two, there's uh, the track in Wheatland. Um, that is oh, badass. Yeah. Did you ever yeah. get to go out there, Blaine? Yeah. I did not get a chance to go out there. That place was pretty cool. How was it sending that big tabletop in uh, a Pro 4? <laughs> well, that's a good, you, good you story, too. let yeah. up, right? Yeah, well, that's, that's a good one. So the first time we get back there, I'm actually doing track walk with my son. And, uh, you know, it's probably been four or five years ago the first time we went back. And I look at that, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's so big. And I'm like, 
I don't think we can clear this thing. And about that time, Brian Deegan shows up and he says, we're going to flatland this. <laughs> Deegan was right. I was wrong. So, yeah, you hit it wide open and you'll flatland. So you had to check up off that thing. I saw a couple pro <laughs> fours kite it and have yeah. issues and stuff like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You had to be careful. If you if you did wood it off that, you know, you had to really worry about getting air under the hood and flipping over backwards. Um, I think I'm trying to remember the guy's name. I think it's Randy Minier had Kyle Duke's old truck yeah, and hit it too hard down. and it caught wind and basically Ugh. just about blew over backward. There were some big crashes there. Uh, I think uh, Rodrigo Ampudia and um, Mari Hart's kid, uh, they, they had a big crash there yeah, too. Yeah, didn't they get together or I something? I think like so. That? Yeah, I just remember, yeah. When, you, when you're going through there, you're coming through that Daytona turn in, uh, let's talk Pro 2, in what gear, second gear going around the... Typically, Wheatland, you know, that corner was uh, high banked, but it got blue, glue, blue yeah. groove and very slippery. So you're basically in high gear pedaling it, just trying to get the oh, thing to hook really? up. Yeah, it would be spinning the tires all the way through that corner. So you really, really backed out of it, very low RPM. So you'd be surprised how, you know, having over 800 horsepower in a, in a Pro 2 uh, on a slippery track like that, you can't get it hooked up. That's why a lot of times you see the Pro Lights guys with um, about half, speed. yeah, I mean, yeah. about half the horsepower, their lap times were right there. It's because we couldn't hook up all that horsepower. So when you're going through a corner and you're getting ready to do a big jump like that, there was a little kind of like a setup jump before it or whatever, but uh, maybe, what, 80% of the way through that corner, you're starting to think about getting the speed coming out of it then? Yeah, you're just, honestly, you're just feeling it and, you know, paying attention to the RPM and if it's revving up, you know, you're lifting. And it's really a hard thing to do, um, you know, when you're, you're basically – giving it 10, 15% throttle in the truck spinning the tires. So, you know, it's, some, you know, something else to talk about there. These trophy trucks going across the dry lake, you know, if they're going 135, the rear tires are typically doing 150. Yeah. They're spinning. Yeah. Because so, you guys are wooded at the time, yeah, right? Yeah, the, the air, trophy trucks aren't very aerodynamic. You know, nowadays they have big blocks in them. They have 1,000 horsepower, and they just can't go through the wind. They can't push it. So if you would it, the rear tires are spinning a lot faster. They, they've had data showing, say, the race is 500 miles um, but the rear tires, they go 575 miles. Yeah. Whoa, really? So there's there's numbers like that. Dude, that's crazy. I wonder what the difference would be between one of the new all-wheel drive trucks since it has so much more uh, available output with yeah. the wheels. I don't know the numbers, but definitely a lot less wheel spin. Dude, that's crazy. That's nuts to think about, right? Because like a normal guy like me just thinks about seeing it, uh, a picture or a, a video of it coming out of the corner. It's like cheating, right? Like it's like yeah. so much faster. But then when you're talking about it in a real world like lake bed, I mean, you could gain, I don't know how long the lake beds are. Let's just say in five miles, you could gain 60 seconds probably because well, you're yeah, and I, I can't. It. I can't speak to the the trophy trucks on what the top speed is, but the short course trucks like at Crandon, a lot of times the two wheel drive truck actually had higher mile per hour at the end of the straightaway. There was a period of time that that was happening. It was hard to understand oh. why they wouldn't get off the corner as, as fast, but at the end of the straightaway, the pro twos would have a higher speed. If you did a radar clock on yeah. that. Wow. Yep. That's crazy. That's pretty interesting to see. I would wonder what the, the scientific stuff is behind that. Um, uh, yeah, so Scott Wren uh, commented in again and said, what's Rob's secret to perfect hair? Scott Rain, I think that question is directed towards me. All right. <laughs> Scott and I have known each other for a long time. Right. Actually, the first event that uh, Warfighter Maid ever got invited to was a uh, uh, super stadium truck. Robbie Gordon and Scott was uh, announcing that yeah. show. And then, of course, the last time we just saw Scott was at the Mint 400 uh 2020 uh where he gave uh team warfighter all of our finisher coins because you know f we had three vehicles uh a total of 14 vets a total of 10 drivers um you know we had a great time so Put the mic a little so, closer to your mouth too so Sc scott's definitely talking about me on that and scott <laughs> i'm gonna tell you I'm gonna, when i see you in person i'm gonna tell you all about it all right <laughs> it's a lot of hair product you guys you are know. gonna have to go to the uh walgreens <laughs> or cbs and uh Just get you all walk around and i'm gonna have to pick all of this product out for him <laughs> get down to the hair salon <laughs> bubba's over here in san Jacinto. <laughs> um, okay so mike gilson also commented in so uh he's asking that same question about the bystanders and stuff in mexico so mike we're not going to get too far into that but safety is always key to all these guys anybody that gets in the truck is always concerned about the stuff that happens internally with their chase crew and then all of the people that are watching no matter what that is always the top priority so um, these guys would give up their race any day to make somebody's safety uh, the top priority uh, ask Rob about his van shoes giving away his secrets to this Rappus brothers 
Oh, that sounds like a good story. I, I'm not wearing Vans anymore, but I I don't even know from high school all the way to, I mean, like 30 years, I think I wore Vans, nothing but Vans. And uh, Amber and I, one time, we we scheduled a trip to go to, I got a trip for her to go Christmas to go to New York City and ended up saying, you know what, I think I better get some walking shoes and, and not wear the Vans. And I ended up, uh, you, nobody will know me in New York City. Like, it'll be okay, you know, wearing wearing some walking shoes or running shoes. And uh, so anyways, so ever since then, and, and Cameron still also used to tell me, because when he did uh, commentary IndyCar, he used to have to walk a bunch, and he was always in vans, and he says, Rob, you got to, you need to put some. <laughs> Those flat sole yeah, shoes will kill you. Exactly. So anyways, yeah, that's, so ever since I started wearing uh, running shoes, um, kind of been stuck to it. <laughs> uh, well, what's this, what's the secrets with the Serapis brothers, though? I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh here we go. I like that. Yeah. I think he... uh, Mike Gilson says Oshkosh had a nice tabletop back in the day. Where was Oshkosh? Is that was Wisconsin? Yeah, too? Wisconsin. So I'm trying to remember the Oshkosh track. Was it a tabletop? You think that was as big as the one in Wheeland? Because no. that thing was a pretty big center. Yeah, man. no. There's we Wheeland is huge. Oshkosh. Anything? Yeah. The biggest jumps back there would be Bark River has a has a pretty big jump. Um, that's probably the biggest one that I know of. Cranon has a, a jump there that's pretty pretty big. But so not. Blanton already asked you what your favorite track was. What was the most technical short course track that you had to drive on? At the end, Glen Helen was getting very very rough, very difficult, um, chopped up. So that's the first one that comes to mind that was pretty pretty darn technical. Yeah, because yeah, it wasn't just thrown in in the corner as yeah, fast no. as you could. The dirt there kind of went away. As as when uh, they built a track um, in the beginning, the track seemed very good, very raceable. As time went on, it seemed like the dirt just went away and the tracks got very narrow and, and they ended up getting rutted up. Glen Helen used to be one of my favorite ones, but as it progressed, it just got narrow in one line. And, yeah. And it didn't, mm. I hated how they put that little chicane before that last yeah. corner and stuff. Just made too. it right at the very end there. Yeah. Um, let's see. So I wanted to uh, talk about a couple stories that I, uh, that I was thinking about asking. Um, do you have a most memorable, well, it's two questions, I guess, a most memorable Baja 500 and a most memorable Baja 1000. And I don't mean the memories like, fuck yeah, we won by yeah. 30 minutes. I mean, like, you came home and you were either, like, just totally defeated or you were like, that was the best freaking trip we ever had. Yeah, I mean, just first thing that came to mind, Baja 500 was uh, 1996 racing Larry Raglan earlier talked about the Mount Rushmore, and Larry Raglan was definitely one of those guys for me, Jack Johnson, Rod Millen, but um, just really had a battle at the beginning with uh, Ivan Stewart. The first half, the, the race course went down the Rue Marosa, and I remember, um, you know, I was driving the, the single-seat trophy truck that some people uh, remember that Nye, Frank, and Dave Clark built, and as you're going down the Rue Marosa, the big trucks, we couldn't make the tight corners, you know, in one turn, so I'd have to pull forward and back up, and I was first on the road at the time, and... Um, Ivan Stewart ended up, he had a little Toyota and the thing could turn really sharp. And I knew he was right there. And I said, oh, well, I got to make this three point corner, but I got to block him so he can't just go by. So I did it real tight and he ended up driving right into my door and uh, he, knew, he knew I had to back up. As soon as I backed up far enough to go, he could go. <laughs> so I'm like, I stopped and I looked at him and, you know, he's You're pointed like, right at my passenger door. I looked at him and I'm like, <laughs> back up you know and he looked at me and he goes no you back up and I go nope you back up and he goes wom wom revs it up and I went <laughs> this is this sounds like a oh parking lot at Walmart dude. like the, the old lady that just doesn't want to give up her parking spot at Walmart yeah. man That's so he, a... he threw the thing in reverse started backing up and hurry up and threw it in gear to go forward and he got me oh. well we got down to the bottom and um there was a little cut over the top of the hill and I got him but then I pulled in my pit and he went by, and then he pulled into his pit. Now we were down there by Laguna Salada, and we had a 60-mile, may, maybe 60, 40-mile graded road. Back in the old days, we didn't run on Laguna Salada. We ran on the, the main road, which is now a chase road, back in there. And going down that road, I knew he just had a six-cylinder, and I had a big V8, and I knew I'd catch him. So I was just pinned in the dust. I couldn't see anything, and I'm just, I know it's getting, the dust getting heavier, 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 and all of a sudden, I got this big whiff of oil, and he blew his motor up trying to run from me. But that same race, <laughs> Larry Raglan and I raced all the way into the finish, and, um, you know, he and I have great stories about that race, and, you know, he said he kept pushing harder, and I knew like he's coming and uh so I kept pushing harder and we ended up winning that race by uh 6 minutes but that's my Baja 500 story. Dang, that's crazy. What about a Baja 1000? Cuz those are like 
quite a bit longer. Well, there's obviously. there's uh, good ones and bad ones. You know, good one was with Carl and Mark Post in 2000, winning the longest uh, Ba 1000 Peninsula what truck run there was. Driving at that time? The Riviera truck, the, the number three. Yeah. Three, yeah. You know, that was a, you know, winning the first Ba 1000 for myself overall. Just the feeling that, yeah. that, that feeling, like I've never felt that again. Um, only the Ba 1000. Bad memories, Ball 1000 was uh, winning the having the overall championship in hand in a race in a 1600 car, one two 1600 car, and um, having the motor blow up and a rod went through the block, and um, you know I was actually racing with Gus Vildosel at the time, and I was sharing my one two 1600 car with uh, Brian Freeman and Bruce Fraley, mm -hmm. and after we were supposed to finish in the trophy truck. I was going to get out and go back and get back in the 1600 car and then finish with that. But um, the trophy truck had a really bad day and Gus Field also ended up pulling out of the race and the 1600 car got in front of me and I'm like, oh no, I need to somehow yeah. get in front of it so I get back in the car because I was driver record. And all we had to do was finish 35th to win the overall championship, but there wasn't even 35 cars. So um, the motor, I got... The 1600 car got in front. We ended up getting the trophy truck down to Valley to Trinidad, and the 1600 car was headed across uh, um, the crossover road over to San Vicente. And when I got to Valley to Trinidad, they told me, hey, uh, the transmission broke in the 1600 car. And oh. I'm like, oh, no. And I was like, Gus, you know, I have a spare transmission here for the, the buggy. Can I load it on the, the trophy truck and take it over there? Well, when I got there, they're like, it's not the transmission. It's the motor. Uh. That a rod went through the block. So all we had to do was finish, and I had some great help from Vegas and some guys there. And we ended up deciding we're going to take the motor apart and clean it up and, and try to assemble it, put it back together. So we did basically on the tailgate there at San Vicente at the BF Goodrich pit. We opened the whole motor up, cleaned all the parts out of it. The, when the rod went around it, broke the the cam uh. and we ended up rebuilding the thing as a two-cylinder whoa and uh the and then the, the buggy went from san vicente out, out to the pacific all the way up the pacific side and it was coming into santa tomas and brian freeman was in the car at the time and i was following him with the trophy truck and as he's going down the twisty hill into santa tomas i'm behind him and all of a sudden i realize oh my gosh he's going too fast because the rpm and being a two-cylinder it's gonna come apart again and yeah. Before I could get on the radio to stop him, it, it did it again. So we coasted it down to the bottom of the hill there, and then I ended up, and the sun was up, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, how much time we got? We had, like, you know, four hours to get to the finish line, and I ended up calling uh, Fat Performance, who built the motor, and I, you know, was 6 a.m., called Ron at his house, and, hey, this is what's happening, and what do we do, and can we, you know, what can we change on the motor? You need to look at the rule book and tell me, like, what – can we do because I had a spare motor yeah. from uh, the Ampudias. Um, we had their spare 1600 motor in my chase truck, and I'm like, I can't just put the thing in because that's against the rules. But what do I have to keep? And the, he didn't have the answer. And ultimately, Brian Freeman had called his dad, and his dad knew the rule book by the back of his hands. He said, You can change everything but the block. So it's like, Okay, we're taking that complete motor apart, we're gonna use everything in it but the block and rebuild this motor that had two. The rod went through the block in two different places, so we patched that thing all back together and, um, you know, got it going again, and we couldn't get the timing set right, and it wouldn't run, and we ended up getting to the finish line, and we were 45 minutes late. Oh, um, dude. So, anyways, that year, it was a that, – that was the year when Volkswagen was involved, and they were paying bonus money, and CarTech was paying bonus money, and I think the overall championship that year would have been about $35,000, and uh, we ended up missing it by 45 minutes, and I still – to this day, I have the engine block with the the aluminum that was screwed to the top of the block to Dang. fill that hole, and then the other hole was JB welded and siliconed. And I have the piston with one of the pistons with the bent rod, and it's labeled on it 2005 Ba 1000. And then inside that's the finisher pin, which we <laughs> yeah. actually weren't official. Or <laughs> the pin is in there, so that that was a a great story, but also. Um, a bad one. Well, yeah, what a, what a pisser, but that's yeah. a constant reminder of, like, yep. gosh, dang it, man. That's why we love Baja, and that's why this desert racing, all things that can happen. And, you know, if you got that group of people together and, and yeah. commiserated about all the things that happened that day and that night and everything else, it's actually uh, – 45 minutes. Holy cow. Yeah. Man, if you could only figure out how to spare 45 minutes, yeah. right? Well, yeah, you always look back and go, ah. We should have rebuilt it the first time <laughs> yeah, right. with the new block <laughs> or with the new parts, not the new block. Uh, John Huppers asked, do you like uh, the Baja 1000 loop or Peninsula runs? You know, Peninsula runs are the, are the coolest, but they're also the most, uh, you know, hardest to the net, the, um, the logistics, figuring out your hotel rooms and, you know, the traveling, the pit plan, the amount of people that we need. Um, they're a the lot more expensive, but uh, Peninsula runs are definitely cool. 
Uh, we had uh, Art com- Art Franco commented in and said, ask him to tell you the story about the Federales stopping the race when he used to drive with Mark Post. Yeah, so there's kind of two stories there. With with that question brings two stories. So What with, vehicle first? Yeah, so with Mark Post, one's with Vildosola, the Federales stopping the race, and then the Riviera truck was with Mark Post, and that's basically when – the, the famous video and the DVD that Jimmy Cook put together um, called Above, Lo- Above the Law with, with uh, Riviera Racing. But um, I started that race, and it was a loop race. Started in Ensenada, came up the Pacific side and finished in Ensenada. And uh, back in the day, we used to, about mile 10 or so, we used to get on the highway there, leave Ensenada, and then make it like a 180 on the highway. And I remember, you know, coming up there, and I threw the truck sideways and basically backed it on the asphalt and, and went down the highway. Um, gave the truck to Mark Post on the Pacific side over at San Vincente. And when he got in the truck, he was going down the highway, and uh, I had jumped in the helicopter, and I was f- up above him following, and all of a sudden I see these cop cars, like, starting to chase him, and I'm like, oh, my God, like, are they, what are they doing? And it's like they're going after Mark. And it's like the, at first I thought they were just going to pass him. No, they pull up behind him next to him, and they're trying to wave him over. And, Whoa. And I'm like, what's going on? And – come to find out you know they were trying to pull him over which we really don't know the reason the only thing that i could think of is what i did at the beginning which that's what we all did and i must have pissed them off and they were coming after us later so um mark figured out and uh kelly curry who was the co-writing um they figured out if they stop and they knew we were in contention to win the race they figured out if we stop and try to figure out what they want like what do we do wrong that we're taking us out of this win so they decided we're going to keep going and we'll talk about this at the finish line and um so they did that and th- the video shows if you guys haven't seen it the cops are basically trying to barricade him and they cut, cut try to block the road where the race course got off the highway and got in the dirt they tried to block the road mark just you know weaved around him and on his way and went on his way and and kept going well at that time you know jimmy cook was in the helicopter with me and he was filming everything and um so they race all the way up the beach and I realize I'm doing split times in the helicopter. I'm like, you know, this is really close and but I think we got this and as Mark they come down the twisty hill into Santa Tomas, the finish line was there. When they got to the bottom they're 300 yards from the finish line and all of a sudden you see federales walking out from the trees and they got their machine guns Whoa. and everything pointed at them and mark stops and i'm like holy cow and, and jim jimmy make sure you're filming film all this so you know and i'm thinking at the time we're winning and they're taking it away from <laughs> us right now if you stop so film this so you can we have yeah. record of how much time it was and um about that time you know, we heard on the radio, you know, Kelly, you know, they're getting out and they're like, they're taking, I, we can see it. They're, they're handcuffing. They got, they're on the hood. They got the machine guns are aimed in the truck and they, they drag Mark out. They handcuff him. They take him away. And then, you know, Kelly's like, oh my gosh, you know, you guys, where's the chase cars? And there was a ton of traffic in Santa Ana Moss coming from both ends and our chase trucks couldn't get there. So we ended up in the helicopter. Kelly's like, hey, you know, you guys see this? What's happening? They're taking Mark. And it's like, Kelly you know, like get in the truck and take it to the finish line, please. <laughs> like got to stop that clock. So he did that. And we stayed in the air hovering and they took Mark post, put him in one cop car, started heading North. They pulled over on the side. They got him out. They put him in another cop car, started heading South. And it's like, man, keep an eye on Mark. Cause yeah. what are they going to do with yeah. them? Going to take him away. And about that time they went South of San Santa Tomas and um, they pulled over on the, the one cop car, pulled over on the side of the highway and I'm like hey you guys you know land the helicopter real quick let me get out run over to the finish line talk to Sal and tell him what's going on so I did and Sal's like what happened what'd you do and I'm like I don't know he goes well something must have happened I go I don't know what happened so Sal sent Oscar Ramos um, who's passed away with me to go to get in a chase truck to go find Mark and when we got down there they had Mark in the cop car and Oscar tried talking to him to, to, to get him released and the federal had nothing to do with it so they they ended up taking mark all the way back to san Quentin. they loaded the trophy truck on up on a flathead took it all the way down there and ultimately you know we got mark out of jail we went back to the finish line now it's like 11 o'clock midnight and sal's tearing down the finish line with the light towers and everything and you know mark had a bottle of don julio and he's <laughs> like sal you know and there he's mark's already been drinking a little bit and then uh Ended up, Sal goes, hey, I don't have enough trucks to take the light towers back to Ensenado. Can we hook one of these up to the Riviera chase truck? So Mark and Sal got a chase truck and went back to town, and and uh, we put the light tower away, and Mark kept telling when we dropped Sal off at the, the hotel, I think it's San Nicholas, Mark kept telling Sal, he was like, in the morning, we're coming back here, and we want to protest because we believe we won this race. So Sal says, well, if you want, come in here. And 
So the footage of all this was on the helicopter, and uh, we tried to get Jimmy Cook to get it off there so we could take it into Sal to show it to him. Well, they, he couldn't get it out of the helicopter, so they flew the helicopter from the Ensenada Airport all the way up to near the San Nicolas Hotel. They could land kind of where the start line is. They could land it there, and Sal told his nephew, Paul Fish, go out there in the helicopter and watch the video and time how long they were stopped and give me that, and I'm going to stay here and talk with Mark and – Sal made some phone calls to the local police and stuff like that to try to find out what was going on. And ultimately, Sal never got a reason why what was happening. So when Paul came back with the footage or told him what he saw and then came back with the time, and you look at the time that we, you know, we, Alan Fluger ended up winning and we ended up getting second, the time that they held us was would have made us still be the winner. Yeah. So all of a sudden, Mark comes uh, Paul Fish goes up the elevator. About 15 minutes later, Mark comes out and he's got his hand in the air, high fiving us, going, "We won!" And about <laughs> nice. the same time, we look and Alan Fluger's walking in the sliding doors into the San Nicolas Hotel to look at the the winning results. And the guy, another guy, came down and crossed out <laughs> Alan oh, Fluger and put name? Mark and Fluger just Dude. went up there and he looked at it and he looked at us and he walked out the door. And uh, so we really don't know the details on all that about what happened, why they tried to come after That's us and intense, stop him. Dude. But um, Jimmy Cook made that movie, and one day, you know, he called me. He's like, hey, video's coming close together, and I got to figure out, you know, what to call it. Give us some ideas and come up with something. Rob and I hung up the phone, and sometime later, I'm like, oh, my gosh. The name of the movie needs to be Above the Law. <laughs> Right, I'm I looking call, that up. I call Jimmy and I'm like, Jimmy, it's got to be above the law. And he goes, No way, we can't do that. <laughs> like, no way. And I'm like, No, I think you got it. Like, this has got to be it. So, anyways, dude, that's a crazy story. Was Mark shit in his pants? Ah, uh, maybe. I know Kelly was because during that, after they they dodged the cop cars and they were in the dirt, you know, for some miles. Kelly told me to stay, say, you know, five ten miles later, all of a sudden, Kelly's like to Mark, Mark. Yes, Kelly. I have kids. <laughs> oh, crap. So, you yeah. know, Kelly was thinking about it. So he was definitely thinking about it. Um, Troy Conanter commented and said, uh, has Rob Mack been to the slip and slide in the Jurassic Park at Crandon? Is that like Lot B or what is that? <laughs> yeah, it's out in the, the camping area. And, and, yes, a long time ago I have, but, but uh, yeah, not recently. <laughs> Good times that- in Crandon. You know, that's why these guys, we were, t- I was talking to these two guys earlier and, we were eating a couple hours ago. Anyways, long story short, both of you guys need to go back to Crandon. Yeah. And we really like, want to. And yeah. check it out. But the slip and slide is one of the things. Back. All right. Does that mean you're going to uh, go back to the slip and slide, Blanton? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> going to have to get back there and check it out. Uh, yeah, David, it's, it is all about the stories, man. It's really cool to see um, how much love and passion is in off-road racing. Uh, so Scott Rain commented in, and I pronounced his name, I think, correctly now. Um, my last question, guys, uh, what does Rob attribute – to the reason why short course for years has been on the edge of getting huge attention mainstream media wise, uh, but continuously fail or fall short. Uh, sometimes, I don't know, you know, I, I, I can talk different ways and look at it different, w- different ways. But, um, you know, one thing I kind of come to realization about is, uh, is I feel that the sport has been too much of a hobby, honestly, you know, there's, it's it's been close and and just never got over the end and when i look back at it um i think to myself you know maybe you know we off-road community is always a big happy family and uh you know we want everybody to race and everybody to be there and we want all the different classes and, and i'm speak, that's what i want i want everybody there but maybe that's been part of our demise where we should have only been one class you know it's the elite and that's it and um you know i don't know maybe maybe that's the reason you know we Back to, you know, off-roading, no matter what it is, desert, short course. Uh, Mickey Thompson, and that's, you know, a little bit give, you know, to, to what I'm saying is Mickey Thompson was a business. And all the teams, you know, Cal Wells, Walker Evans, Ivan Stewart, or um, Cal Wells, um, Roger Mears, Jim Venable, all those guys, they ran it as a business. It was full-time shops, and they ran it as a business. And that's the most successful that short course or any off-road has ever been. And I think... Um, you know, there was, there was no hobbyists yeah. racing in the grand national sport truck. There was, it wasn't there for fun. You were there to run a business, to get sponsors and, and basically work at it 24 seven. And I think the other short course stuff, you know, yeah, there's been the top tier guys like myself or, you know, that are, we're, we're working hard and it's my 24 seven, 365 to try to be successful, but half the field, it's just their, it's their weekend getaway. It's their, their 
relax and, and uh, you know, their time to blow off steam and get some adrenaline. And I think that's just always been the thing. We're trying to include everybody in. And I hate to say it because, you know, what I love about off-road is that we are a family. We all get to camp together and talk together, but maybe that's what that's what's happened and that's what it needs. It needs um, an elite class, just like trophy trucks, you know, back in the day when trophy trucks started. Do you know why the reason why it's called trophy truck? Because we race for a trophy. The owners, and those were the Mickey Thompson guys, they realized in order to make this big and try to uh, make it sustainable with sponsors, we need to showcase one and we need to have the trophy trucks race by themselves so they can get all the attention and they get all the filming and try to put the best show out there together. And uh, we did that for quite some time. And now, you know, you get, and I get it, you get the, everyone else wants to be on TV and, um, you know, and that's ultimately what we've been doing. We've been letting everyone get on TV and maybe that's the reason why it hasn't gone think, all the way to the top. I think one of the most important things that you just mentioned there is, uh, well, you said the teams are running it like a business, but you also have to think about like, um, let's c- compare it to the technology industry. Apple has a certain amount of products, right? Apple has the best selling product, which is the iPhone. That's their trophy truck, right? That's their big dog. All of the other products just get discontinued. Yeah. We don't care about these ones because they don't sell. They don't produce. And so when you think about it from a racing standpoint, it's very, very similar to what you just said. The things that produce should be the focus points. Everything yeah. else um, could be either a feeder or a regional or some sort of other series. You don't have to get, stop it. You just have to segment it differently. We, we, never, na- we never made the the big show be the Super Bowl. Right. You know, exactly. we we think we did. You know, Cranon's the Super Bowl. No. You know, you know, and I and I'm I'll talk this way and this way. I love off road because of the family and the camaraderie. Mm-hmm. But when you want to talk about why did it never make it why hasn't it ever make it to the very top? That's probably why. Yeah. It's exactly. too much of a hobby. And you know what's funny is uh a lot of people say the same thing about motocross. Motocross is way bigger than off road, right? Yeah. And then supercross and stuff like that. But they still say the same thing. They say, Why isn't it bigger? It's so much cooler than let's just say football for yeah. these off road or these motocross guys. But they can't because they don't segment it properly. There's no Super Bowl. There's only four fifties and two fifties and the way that they produce it is uh, flawed, so to speak, and it can't grow any further. So it's just like uh, you get to a certain level and you stop learning and you stop growing. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, let's get on something else. Uh, there's somebody that you might know, Caden. Yeah. says, hi, Dad. Hi, son. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool that Caden commented in. Hey, well, I want to throw a shout-out to Caden, too, because he's been kicking some serious ass in the Razors these days, man. Yeah, he has. Um, he's only been racing for three years, and uh, he's already won, I think, at least three championships, and uh, he's – getting close again he moved up to the pro classes and in the work series and then he had his first run in uh with jagged x and san felipe in the score race and they ended up winning yeah exactly nice. uh jamie campbell who you may know uh said did you race willow springs score off-road world championship yeah i did that's back in the late 80s or early 90s and i raced for walker evans there willow springs was awesome uh it was a, it was a good time i don't remember what happened to me but yeah that a, that actually was it's another story there. Rod Millen, um, Venable Racing, Ford Rough Riders. So I think that was 1990, 89-90, probably 90. And um, I had just gotten a phone call from Frank D'Angelo, uh, who was with BF Goodrich, and asked if I was interested. They told me Robbie Gordon's moving out of the Venable ride, and he's uh, he's going, um, I think it was IMSA racing then, and he's moving out, so that seat's open. And we've narrowed it down to two people. Um, that we'd like to, to give the ride to, and we want to give you guys both test drives. And um, can you go do it right after Willow Springs? And I said, yeah, uh, and who's the other guy? And they go, Rod Millen. And I thought to myself, I'm done. <laughs> like, he's got the ride. <laughs> and I, I got the ride probably because Rod was too busy or had to do something else. But Yeah, um, but nonetheless, you got it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Dang, that's pretty sweet. Um, and yeah, Jamie, I hope you're drinking a, a cactus cooler and Tito's, buddy, or maybe even some tequila with that cactus cooler. Um, yeah, it's, John Lewis says, uh, here's part of the Mark Post video. Oh, so they have the video. Thanks for commenting on that. Uh, I'm going to actually go check that out. Yeah, so <laughs> that looks actually, dude, it looks intense, man. Uh, or sounded intense. No, it, it was. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. Have you driven an SST? Yeah. The oh, first, okay. The, so the, the question is, do you enjoy short course or SST more? Um, so SST, they're, they're different, honestly, a lot different. The SST trucks were, um, you know, ultimately Robbie started out, we were racing in stadiums and that was his try to go after what Mickey Thompson did. But very quickly, 
um, I, he got the opportunity to go to Long Beach Grand Prix and um, run the trucks there at IndyCar race. And uh, Long Beach, before that race, uh, he took all the off-road guys. So they ran it. We ran at uh, Phoenix at um, the football stadium there. And uh, and then the very next race, we were running at Long Beach. And everybody was off-road guys. And we needed some street asphalt time to see how these trucks would work. And this le- leading to a funny story. So they, they Robbie got us all to go down to Long Beach to where the – shipyards are there and there's big empty asphalt yard and we we're all get they put cones up and we we're getting to run around and asphalt get the feel because if you guys have seen those typically when they're asphalt they're lifting one tire off the yeah, ground they're a a lot of they, traction. those trucks are absolutely not what you'd want to build to race on asphalt <laughs> but because of that they're so exciting yeah. they're hard to drive they were they had uh li- not enough Flopping braking. all over the yeah, place not enough brakes you know not enough sway bar too tall too tall of tires just on and on and on but that's what made them so exciting so as we're out there running around, Justin Lofton, P.J. Jones, myself, Robbie, and many others, Ari Leindyke Jr., we're all out there taking our turns, and and uh, Robbie ends up going, hey, it's okay, it's my turn, and says, Justin, give me your truck, I'm getting in it, and Justin's like, no, not my truck, and uh, Robbie gets out there, and he's, I don't even know, he's going 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, and I guess he'd been doing this already in his own truck, um, and uh, he ended up grabbing the e-brake or whatever to spin the thing around. He's going like 80 miles an hour across the asphalt, and he was trying to spin the thing out and do a 360. Well, when he did, it caught, and it flipped on the asphalt, just ka 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 And it's like, oh, my gosh, like, he's dead. You know, we all took off running over there. Before we got there, he was out of the truck. It landed on its wheels, walked around the whole thing, and got in it, and he was gone before we even got there. <laughs> Whoa! But the reason why, he was on Toyos normally, and Justin was on Yokohamas, and the Yokohamas, when they got hot, they got a lot softer. And Robbie wasn't ready for that grip, and he just, just destroyed uh. that truck. And Justin, like, that's my truck. <laughs> He's all mad. So, yeah, Dude. SST was a lot of fun. I was got, it? Were those cars built? Were they built like the Mickey Thompson truck? Um, kinda? sort like, of. I mean, Robbie took that model. They were small like that. You know, the chassis were very small, and Robbie made a modular so there was like the center part, and then the rear unbolted, the front unbolted, and they were all identical. And it was really a good model, ultimately, and we had a lot of fun doing it. And ultimately, um, you know, we did, you know, did a lot of the the street stuff. But the IndyCar fans, when we went to Long Beach, that was getting ready to say that when we went there, we practiced, and then we got done with practice, and the fans were like, "Oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like that." That when the trucks hit those aluminum ramps the noise that it makes it makes you like what was that so everyone would turn and then the trucks were up as high as the top of the chain link fence and the, the fans are just blowing away so yeah definitely um a lot of fun driving those things so R- robbie uh, has appreciates warfighter made in the vets and all that stuff and invited us out to a the sandsport super show where he was doing an sst race yeah and i brought out uh combat wounded double leg amputee davy lynn Davey Lynn's a hoss, even without his legs. And he was supposed to take Davey for a ride in his truck. And Davey comes walking up there, and he looks through the window talking about small chassis, and he's like, I'm not fitting in this, right? So Robbie looks at me, and he's just like, all right, you're up, right? <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I'm not a good code dog at all. <laughs> so I get in there, and, you know, Robbie's just like, hey, you know, just just hold on to your harness, you know, don't touch this and yeah. whatever. Starts going around the, the track. It hasn't been tested yet, right? The very first aluminum ramp, he puts it, he puts it on the bike and just starts driving around the course, yeah. right? Then he starts hitting the aluminum ramps at full speed, and even from the truck, it is loud as can be, right? Well, then he had like a, a joker lane where it was like, two really big jumps or just a whole bunch of moguls going down. So we hit the the moguls and we're bouncing off the top of them, come back around and he goes to hit the the first big jump and we flat land that thing so freaking hard. And you know, I got back issues like everybody else. And uh, all of a sudden he comes to the radio and he's like, Hey, uh, Jim Bob, go ahead and take about two feet off of that. <laughs> top of that thing. I was like, man, I wish you would have took two feet off of that before we hit it. Before you took two inches oh, off your back. Oh, my God. I used to be 6'5". Now I'm only 6'3". You know? so. But those trucks are pretty rad then. Huh? No, they were. They're a lot of fun. And Robbie, you know, obviously, he's an incredible talent. And him putting those races on. The finale um, was in Las Vegas. And uh, it was at Planet Hill, Hollywood. Planet Hollywood, Caesars Palace parking lot area, and part of the course went around uh, the a roundabout around the mm-hmm. the Planet Hollywood sign. As it went around that, it was the park. The driveway went down through Planet Hollywood, but 
if you went to the right, then you go into the parking lot of Valet for Caesar's Palace. So Robbie needed to figure out how to get the race course to come down around the roundabout and then back up in to the valet parking lot. So he ended up taking those aluminum ramps and he, he had one, but he needed two. So he took K rail and then put the second one on top of the K rail, tied them together, ended up rat come along and doing all that oh to make them jump, God. to jump over a planter and a block wall that had plants on it and then land in the valet parking lot. When you landed, you were landing on the, the, um, the parking barriers and then make a 180, a 180, and then a 90, then jump through a planter, but underneath the Caesars Palace sign. And as Jesus we got there, Christ. everything happened in one day. So you'd show up, practice, say, 2 o'clock, and then racing started at 7 p.m. So we show up. We're doing track walk. Track still being built. They, like, they couldn't start building the track till you know, 12 a.m., you know, Friday morning, yeah, yeah. and then the race is Friday night. So they had to do all that stuff, and they're still building the track hurry, and it's like, okay, you know, practice was supposed to already happen. And about that time, we're looking we're looking at this ramp to try to jump the wall, and P.J. Jones goes, Robbie, the ramp is not as high as the block wall. We're not going to clear the wall. And Robbie's like, it'll make it. Don't worry. So Robbie's always notorious to say, hey, Sheldon Creed, get in your truck and see if it'll make it. Or, hey, Justin Lofton, get in your truck. And everybody else would look the other way. Well, this time, um, I forgot who it was. I think Justin ended up doing it. And it's like, we're all, me and PJ would stand back and watch. And we're like, Robbie, the damn tires are hitting the plants as he goes over the top. It's that close. Like, you better do something. So about that time, actually, this happened right before that. We're sitting there looking at the ramp, and there was a suit and tie guy coming from planet hollywood walking up the thing and he's you know walking along quickly and he's like where's robbie gordon and it's like he's over there and robbie you haven't done one thing you said you were gonna do pack this shit up and get it out of here right and robbie goes and talks to the guy talks to the guy turns around looks at all of us he goes practice in 10 minutes <laughs> whoa <laughs> but that's robbie you know he yeah. pulled so much stuff off and you know Dude, anyways. were you when you guys were doing track walk were you like what the f oh yeah with Robbie, you know, he's always trying to entertain. You know, yeah. he, he kind of had the Mickey Thompson mentality and he wanted to entertain and he knew, you know, that he needed to make the fans, you know, go crazy. And that's why, you know, he'd do the crossover jumps and yeah. stuff that you would the think, well, you could never do this, Robbie. It's like, Robbie, we can't do this. No, we can do it. You know, we got it. So uh, Peter Calhoun commented and said those uh, new BFG graphics look bad. And then, well, we can say it out here. Ass. <laughs> so. Thanks, Pete. Uh, John Lewis said, Crusher Mount Cadillac, one for the road, uh, starts at uh, 30 seconds. Oh, it must be the video, I guess. Yeah, huh? somebody said that the link wasn't working, so he wanted to know the name. Uh, could you give some pointers to us racers just starting out on how to get sponsors? That's a loaded question right there, man. <laughs> hey, so before you actually give a pointer, I, let's just give them one tip. But um, if you do want to see, uh, Tim, if you do want to see some uh, ways that you can actually learn how to get sponsors, we did a uh, an episode with uh, a gentleman named Alex Stryler, uh on motorsports marketing and sponsorship. I'm not sure which episode it was, but uh, check out the archives for Alex Stryler's episode. And uh, he gives some fantastic information in there. Um, so go to the dirtlifeshow.com and look for the Alex Stryler episode because it's fantastic he's written a book too so yeah. i don't know the name of it but um motorsports marketing yeah there you go yeah so his book is a good start and then yeah <laughs> yeah so alex is an awesome guy and in fact alex who helped me get uh, carl to come on the show today so awesome um i have actually alex actually does a uh, a whole class alexstryler.com we'll plug him um and he does every tuesday he does uh introductions to people who tell you how to get sponsors from their first person perspective in fact i think he had some bfg guys on maybe last week or the week yeah. before too so um go check it out man uh what would be your f one tip um, just, you know, be a straight, honest person and, you know, always shake hands, say hi, be good. Yeah. Give back. Um, and then work hard at it and show your passion. You know, for me, a lot of my stuff has happened through my life, especially in the beginning is the handshakes and being truthful and honest and working hard. Yeah. 100%. Um, let's see. It looks like they're talking about the video and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was evil Knievel all over. It sounds like what Robbie was trying to do over there in Vegas. Yep. Huh? Uh, how was it like racing at near home though? Because you probably didn't have to show up after you eat breakfast well, twenty minutes down the street, huh? That's the thing. SST was pretty cool because you know he sold sponsorship. You you could bring your own sponsorship to a truck and buy a truck and yep. get to drive it. But 
you know, they, they brought the trucks, they prepped the trucks. You didn't have to bring your own guy mm -hmm. or anything. And, um, you'd bring them, bring the money and go drive them. And ultimately, you know, when you're done, if the truck's all torn up, you know, there was times like I felt guilty, like putting my helmet in my bag and just walking away, <laughs> you know, but yeah. you're you like, know. didn't I need to fix something? Or yeah. like <laughs> well, in the end, you know, some, sometimes I say, you know, my analogy is, you know, it's like going to the go-kart track with your buddies. You know, you go in, you pay, yeah. you drive. You're not and supposed when you're to done, touch each other. No. Yeah. And when you're done, you're laughing, giggling, yeah. high-fiving out the door going, how cool was that? So yeah. credit to Robbie for, you know, having those dreams and stuff. You know, he's an incredible person, and, you know, I swear there's at least two of him as much stuff as he does and tries yeah, to really accomplish. It really is crazy, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, thank you very much for all you guys submitting all these questions and stuff. Um, I have two questions left. I knew that I was, should keep my list short because we were going to have so many people talking. Um, before I ask those, do you have any, Rob? No. Well, okay, yeah. So, <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, people have always asked me from being in combat, like, oh, were you scared when you were doing this? And the answer is always like, no, you're, you're so focused on what's going down at that specific moment, but I've been scared to death, like way before it or way after, um, you're, it's all done. And then you start thinking about all the things that could have happened. Yeah. Have you ever had like that moment, whether in open desert or short course where you were just like, holy <laughs> fuck yeah th i think it's at a totally different level yeah but i understand what you're saying and yeah you know a lot of times when you're leading up to a race you know there's times when you know very especially you're not prepared that well you don't feel good about it but very nervous and things like that and um you know other times stuff happens so quick too yeah you know and uh i think for me when you know the crash happens or something things go into slow motion and you really take everything in you know yeah. it's amazing um you know, the last big crash I had that I remember was with Rodrigo Ampudi at Glen Helen. We tied up and went yep. up in the air. But, uh, you know, I remember that and, like, how slow everything happened, yeah. even from going up the ramp. And it's like thinking, you know, this could happen. Yeah. And it did. Yeah, 15 and then, seconds feels yeah, like 30 it, minutes. Exactly. Yeah. It seems like forever. Exactly. So when things things go wrong, it does seem like it happens in a long time. Yeah. What, about, long time. what about, like, the um, – well, how about – do you like, there's two questions that he's asking – do you get nervous before? Uh, most of the time not. I guess ultimately what I do is when I'm not prepared properly, right. you know, or things aren't quite going right. Oh, and like nervous that you just fix something and you got to go out and like. Not so much that. I go, you know, you know, the, everything leading up to the race, there's just a bunch of stuff, you know, and, yeah. and you know, if, if, you know, I have basically any race or just the whole mental list or paper list or whatever, everything needs to get done. Yep. And if everything gets done, then everything's going well. And then it's, it's like nothing, you Shout know, out but, to Lechero. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what about afterwards? Um, no, not, I mean, sometimes there's some incidents that happen, you know, where you're like, you know, uh, uh you almost hit something and you right. know, you, you, you have no time to think about it. And you're like, after the fact, you think like, Wow, if that would have happened. Yeah. So that's what he yeah. You know. yeah. So unless it's like a big shaker. We were actually talking about this with the kids last week, um, Caden Danbury and Jacob Peter. Um, one of the best traits, um, and I think probably you guys have experienced this too, Rob, uh, in combat and stuff. One of the best traits about any racer is that they can forget quickly. So you go into corner A, corner B, corner one, two, and you make a mistake. By the next corner, number three, you're back on track and you're going straight forward to the front or whatever it is. So or it, you forget you made the mistake and you do it again. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> well, a good hopefully point. Not. <laughs> but uh, but that's a good trait to have. And I think, does it happen in combat as well or no? You know, in on in all honesty, you try to train yourself to such a level that. Um, the, the, a lot of the things that you're doing don't require conscious thought. Everything is just subconscious. You're just Muscle subconsciously memory. going through the motions, you know, pulling the trigger, speed reloads, you know, getting your weapon back in the fight, whatever the case may be. Uh, or as we always like to say, shoot, move, and communicate. Y you do that to such a level that a lot of times you can't, like people walk up and be like, bro, what the fuck happened, you know, ec during X, Y, and Z? And you'd be like, I don't really remember because I didn't have to think about it. My body was just 
doing it doing it and i was really focused on one specific thing like that bad guy or making sure that my guys were you know doing what they were supposed to be doing type type thing so i always refer to it as a picture book you're you're flipping through pictures and each one of those pictures you remember specifically because you're looking at that picture but then you need somebody else to walk over with their picture book to kind of fill in those blanks to put together a whole, you know, kind of a whole scene of what yeah, happened. That makes sense. And that's a, probably what Rob was talking to or leaning on a little bit was that you don't necessarily remember because you're just there doing yeah, it. Right. Man, that's crazy. It's pretty cool that, that racers can actually do that, though, because that really shows you um, the different level of uh, intensity mentally that the the professional racers have against the the amateur racers uh appreciate oh, t- tim kern said thank you for the input on the sponsorship stuff uh john lewis said yeah that Ampudio thing was pretty gnarly uh we actually talked about it on the way up here um uh, blanton and i it was a pretty gnarly uh a pretty gnarly crash um stuff like that happens though you know what i mean and, and you just have to unfortunately you have to deal with it at the at the time but those uh 15 seconds do seem like forever, <laughs> don't they? Uh, Don Haugen said, uh, dude, you were pissed. I remember that. You took the short end of the stick on that one. Uh, yeah, I don't think Rob wants to talk about that right now. So we're going to move on. Rob raced at Crandon after a uh, bad wreck in Glen Helen with his collarbone still broken. You broke your collarbone then? Was uh, it was a different one. It was a different yeah, it was it was a different one. She had to make a custom <laughs> pad to put inside your suit uh, that you borrowed uh, Carl's mud MU. Uh, oh, they uh, call them. Uh, yeah, it's like the the, the tear offs mud mutcher. They call them. Mm. Yeah, so I had to borrow Carl's mud mutcher so I could just push a button to have the tear offs, and I had to go race. Oh, that was because the year. you couldn't really move your arm. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember if that was the year I was racing. I was definitely racing both um, Lucas Oil and Torque back east. And I had a race, and my collarbone was broke. So, we so had to, when you have a broken collarbone, you kind of you probably have to hold it low, and then just barely u- use your other hand. And yeah, I think I was driving one-handed mostly. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, man. I I could only imagine. Do you remember what your results were that weekend? Not as good as you wanted. <laughs> I think we did okay. I think we we were you know, obviously in a points chase, and Dude. probably did better than expected with one arm. Ta- yeah. <laughs> It, there's no expectations when you're driving with one arm in a badass truck like that, man. So congratulations on doing all that. And actually, that's awesome that Amber was able to hook you up with all that, too. Um, yeah, thank you for your service, Rob. Uh, oh, Mike, it was a pleasure to serve, man. And uh, David P. said, yeah, that was gnarly uh, when <laughs> he went with you to the hot pits. Um, need sponsor for Atlanto Grand Prix. Hey, man, go get them, Steve. Uh, check out that episode that we did, Motorsports Marketing and Sponsorship with Alex Stryler. You can uh, find some really good tips over there. All right, so the questions that I was going to ask is the uh, last two questions. When you get free time, what do you like to do? Where do you like to go? Um, well, we like to ride our Polaris Razors. Um, I like to chill, just do nothing sometimes. <laughs> I bet. Doing nothing's pretty pretty nice. Um Starting to go well. Started to go to the Lake River last summer a little bit, and we just did it yesterday for Mother's Day, and maybe start doing that again more. And maybe that's is that why you're glowing today? Yeah, <laughs> that's makeup. You got refreshed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and then uh, the last just kind of question that I had was, uh, who are some of the people that have influenced you the most over the years, whether they're living or past? Yeah, uh, I know that you've mentioned a couple to us, like. Uh, uh, different people that are in the off-road industry out here in San Jacinto, but overall, who do you think has influenced you the most? Oh, starting out, you know, my mom and dad, I was talking earlier to Rob about it, but, you know, certain quotes that they've said that have stuck in my head that I really didn't realize, you know, in the beginning, but how I've actually applied them and now, you know, trying to teach them to the the kids and stuff like that. Uh, So my, my parents, honestly, in the beginning, you know, hooking up with Nye Frank and Dave Clark and just all the knowledge, you know, uh, it's really in 97, I had to start my own team and try to figure all this out on my own. The first time I had to run my own team and um, did a lot of traveling with those guys and just a lot of stories, especially with Nye, um, just his thoughts. And it, it, you could be sitting in a group of people and everybody be saying, you know, this is what that is. And Nye would come in and explain to you why that's not what it is. It's this. And then the whole group would understand and he would explain it to us so that we would all understand and w- so he he was an amazing guy, um, you know. Uh, just as as time gone, there's been a lot of people, and ultimately, you know, I'm 
just picking up stuff from everybody. I, I realize, you know, a lot of stuff you're, you listen and learn and then apply it. And you don't even really know where it came from. Right. So, um, you know, honestly, my parents, biggest, most nigh, um, buddies, friends, you know, just all the acquaintances over time, you know, you pick up stuff from everyone. Well, one of the main reasons that I asked that question is because, um, on the adverse side of it, you have been very, very influential in many, many racers' careers. And I'm not just talking about the guys that are up now. I mean, throughout the years, even guys that you've raced against uh, at the same competitive level, same ranks, everything, um, just like Carl Renner that we talked to today, you were influential in his whole career. I mean, uh, I talked about this yesterday on a side-by-side ride with some of the motocross guys. What if Jeremy McGrath, or excuse me, what if Jeff Emig never had a Jeremy McGrath to compete yeah. against? He would have been the top dog for so many years, right? And that influence that you bring to the track every time you show up helps elevate everybody. It's yeah. pretty it's pretty dang cool, man. So whether you realize it or not, you're definitely changing yeah. and making things cool. No, as, as I get older and as I, you know, just kind of look at it stuff more and I see these little kids moving up and um, I realize these little kids have been watching and paying attention and they do admire, you know, and try to model what they've what I've done and they're trying to do the same thing. Their parents have said, hey – you know, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to be. That's how you need to act. So I know later in life, I'll even appreciate it even more. Yep. But, um, yeah. Especially I'm with to, your son, too. Yeah, I'm starting to realize it, you know, that these kids, you know, they're paying attention. And, you know, whether it's uh, Clint Berry's son, you know, or Connor Berry, these these kids, and they're like, I realize, you know, they look at me and, you know, I'll, um, you know, high five them and stuff. And some of them will say, like, you know, I'm trying to be like you, yeah. you know. So that's quite an honor and you know later in life you know it's one of the things that i'll probably appreciate more than anything is that dude 100 percent. It, it's funny that you say it like that too because um one of my buddies from arizona his name is brian forrester he has a son named tatum forrester that's racing 170s now um tatum is uh he gets like so giddy when he can go wash rj anderson's body yeah. panels after the short course races um you didn't know that this happened today because we showed up a little bit earlier than you to the shop well lucero um i asked him if you know he needed help because he was washing the body panels for your truck and uh he goes yeah dry this thing off and immediately i thought holy cow i'm sitting here a middle-aged <laughs> man washing a door on a trophy truck this is amazing and for me to understand what those kids think at that time, yeah. like that has got to be the most fantastic thing for all of those kids at the races. So I personally think that the more time and the more value um, that you can give to those generations as uh, your career progresses is uh, going to really, really make that uh, sentimental when you retire. Yeah, That'd absolutely. That'd be pretty cool. Um, okay. So we already asked who your Mount Rushmore was, um, but we've already we had a couple people talk about uh, and comment in what your plans are. Um, I guess in the, we'll call it the near near future here, um, maybe twenty twenty one and beyond. Yeah, it's really you know racing is what I do. You know I love doing it. Obviously, short course uh, with Lucas Oil going away, um, losing the Rockstar sponsorship a couple years ago. Uh, through the sale to to Pepsi, just it ended up being bad timing there for myself and RJ. But um, you know, times have been hard with COVID, and things are changing. And I was explaining to you guys yesterday. You know, for so many of my racing years, I've been navigating through this one hallway or this new one tunnel, and now that hallway or tunnel is just a different direction. Trying to figure things out, um, continue racing. You know, trophy truck in the desert. You know, Caden's racing a lot of. I think he's racing a lot more than I am. He's racing all the work series, and he's been. Uh, riding with a guy named Brent Fox in the, the Best in the Desert series, and he'll be racing this weekend at the the Nevada, Baja Nevada race. And Go kick some ass, kid. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I want to get back doing stuff. Short course is, you know, the stuff that's happening back at Crannon's, you know, it's it's awesome. Um, you know, Lucas Oil going away, and then, you know, the guys at Gas picking yep. that up, Lee Perfect, Dave Cole, you know, the Polvori family and everybody there, you know, it's, it's – it's a good thing. It's yeah. it's going to take some time, and, and hopefully everything gets going again. And, you know, ultimately, um, I was explaining earlier, it's like my direction is kind of not as solid as it had been in before, but things are starting to come back, and, you know, score looks very strong. All that stuff's been consistent. The desert stuff's starting to be here in the, in the U.S. has been pretty consistent. So 
um, hopefully things pan out and start racing a lot more. So uh, uh, a couple questions came in that are really uh, kind of on that same line about where you're going to race and stuff. But first, Don uh, Haugen said, Rob represents how we all should act in motorsports. He is humble, competitive, and a true leader in the sport. I couldn't agree more, man. Uh, Luke Alcock says, uh, how great was the Mint 400 win? Uh, let's see here. And I think that there's a secondary follow-up to that that says, to cap your long list of races you've won. Yeah, it was good. I went in the mint, you know, and honestly, I, I've raced a really lot of years, but I've only, you know, in all those years, you know, maybe a, maybe a third of them um, have been in, racing in a vehicle that was capable of winning overall. So, you know, I hadn't won the mint overall until uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, 17 or 18 yes. was the yeah. first time I ever won it overall. But, you know, 25 or 30 of the years, I wasn't in a vehicle that was capable of winning it overall. So ultimately, that was a good one to, to get off the bucket list. V really, Vegas Reno is another one. I, have, I haven't won that one overall yet. So Really? Yeah, exactly. Dang, yeah, dude. so that's another one I got to work on. We, we times we thought, you know, other people think that I've got one, you know, one win at every major race, but the Vegas Reno is one of them that... that are there that, any other ones that elude you? Um, there's, I'm sure there are. There's a few others. Um. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's more, but definitely is a big high profile race. Vegas Torino is one of them. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And then Tim Kern uh, commented and said, I'm trying to be like you as well. Uh, I've looked up to you since uh, the first time I watched you race at Firebird Raceway uh, a long time ago. Well, Tim's got a story similar to mine because that's the first time I saw you and Carl battle. So that's pretty cool, man. You got a good person to look up to here. He's a solid guy for sure. Uh, and uh, what's that last one that John Lewis is saying there, Rob? says, uh, that's the feeling I had when I was a kid and got one of Rob's bedsides at the Mickey Thompson race. It's still up in the garage. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And, you know, Warfighter made as a Rob Mack uh, door. Ooh, yeah. Hanging up there, too. Dude, that's pretty cool. Uh, how does that work? So uh, our audience members can know, like, uh, at a short course race, do you give away um, panels and stuff sometimes? Yeah, usually after the race or you know, each night and maybe even during the races, if there's body panels that are torn up and stuff, kids come up and we try to give all that stuff away and let them walk away with a souvenir. Have some rad garage art. Yeah. It's always one of the raddest things too, is just watch like this five-year-old who can't even carry this <laughs> thing, just dragging it through the dirt, <laughs> going back, you know, just the stoke on his face is yep. just, you know, memories. And, and apparently, uh, you know, Tim has one of those or John. John, think, yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool, man. It is pretty neat to see, though. Uh, we did a contest with Jeff Proctor of Honda Off-Road to have people do it. And, man, we got so many messages for people that wanted garage art. It was really cool. So uh, that stuff is uh, pretty memorable for everybody. Uh, all right, well, we're going to wind down the show a little bit. I know that you said that, uh, you know, 2021 is going to be a little bit of a, of a weird year. But if you had your, your druthers and you could predict the future, 2022 to like 2023, what would you just be doing, man? You'd be racing short course and desert just yeah. every weekend or what? Yeah, as much as possible. Racing's, racing's what I've done for so long. It's about all I know. So, um, you know, short course stuff, I'm hoping it gets going again. Um, it's you know, the Midwest series, honestly, you know, again, telling you guys you need to go back to Crandon, but that series is looking pretty good. Um, and then obviously, you know, the great American short course series out here with Dave Cole, you know, being king yep. of the hammers and everything that he can do. Um, I'm looking for great things there too. I think, you know, it'll take time obviously. And I heard and, there's a Nora in his future with Warfighter yeah, made. Yeah, a couple exactly. More, a couple more ATSs, you know. Just, yep. Yeah. I think in the September, we'll probably go hang out at one of those ATSs in yep. the unicorn too. Uh, hey, have you ever done KOH? I don't know if yeah. I asked you last time. Yeah. So yeah, I've done it uh, maybe five times. The first couple times, um, the first time I did it was with the team uh, Blue Torch. Um, oh, yeah, and it was actually in a, in a big truck. Or in yep. a and then the second couple years, I did it with Poison Spider, Larry McRae, and ended up uh, finishing, I think, 13th, like my third year. Wow, um, that's pretty good. And then uh, then I the last three or four years or three years, I missed a year in there. I'd been driving with Greg Adler. Yeah. And um, this year, I wasn't supposed to drive with him this year. He called me on Thursday and said uh, – could you help me out and do the de desert section? So we went and did that and had fun. And But, yeah. <laughs> David P. said, yeah, and even the fiberglass shards. <laughs> so people are really into those things, I guess, yeah. huh? Uh, Tim Kern says, I got a fender mount uh, from the last Lucas Oil race at Wild Horse. That's pretty cool. You didn't race Wild Horse when it was backwards, did you? No. Yeah, I didn't get to race there either. All right. Uh, before – I get in the rapid fire Q and A, Rob. You got any questions for McCachran over here? I don't. I'm just stoked to be here. Yeah, it's pretty Likewise. awesome. Likewise. Um, all right. So uh, actually, 
Are you going to race Crandon in June this year? Um, we'll see. I hope so. Yeah, that'd be a pretty good race to be at. Uh, all right, so rapid fire Q and A, and I don't know because I didn't. Uh, I don't have the printout from when your last episode was. So if these are duplicates, just tell me. Okay. Dunes or the river? It's river now. <laughs> the river. <laughs> okay, since it's summertime. <laughs> yeah. Uh, three wheeler or quad? Quad. Uh, Cincerillo or I don't want to say Cincerillo or Osborne. Um, El Hombre or Tomac? The reason I'm asking this is because we got a freaking lecture from Lucero today. Well, I got to say his Tomac. favorite guys were, man. <laughs> I'm in the shop, so I got to say Tomac. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Lucero is a big Tomac fan. Oh, he's so, a big so, Ombre guy, yeah. too. He actually said that to be his number two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about mountain bike or uh, road bike? Mountain bike. You go mountain bike? Absolutely. Do you have a mountain bike? I did. You did? Well, actually, I still do. My son's commandeered mine. We, we had a little theft, and we lost his bike. So he's comedy on my yours. bike. Gotcha. Uh, coffee or tea? Tea. Uh, Never tasted coffee. Yeah. On dude. purpose. Same with me. That's, yeah. Fun fact, you're the only one who's drinking coffee in this room. <laughs> oh, that, that is. <laughs> Fun fact. Favorite soda? Uh, it's been Mountain Dew lately. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Mountain Dew. Jamie Campbell over there, we conver- converted him <laughs> over to Cactus Cooler, so he's a big Cactus Cooler guy. Um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Uh, you you asked me that before, maybe, or somebody did. I don't know. Maybe to be, I think invisible was one of them. What about teleporting? Because then you yeah, can, like, teleporting, haul yeah. ass to the finish There's line. so many. <laughs> uh, yeah, so some of these I may have asked you before. Uggs or Crocs? Uh, Uggs. <laughs> I love that. I'm the same way, too. I'm like, fuck those shoes. Yeah, like, I hate those shoes so much. It, uh, I need to switch it up because we're so over the Uggs and Crocs these uh, days. Uh, most memorable race. He already answered that one. Favorite flavor of ice cream? It's probably. Got, uh, I wouldn't mind if uh, we, got, simple. we got Rob uh, Chips Blanton. Chips and cookie. Chips and cook, cookies and cream. Or cookies whatever. and cream or yeah. whatever it is. Uh, Robert Blanton, I would p- appreciate your answer as well. Strawberry rendezvous. Boom. Audio clip of the night. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Uh, Netflix. What's a cat? <laughs> what is that? Uh, Netflix or YouTube? YouTube. Supercross. Um, yeah, Supercross or Motocross? Supercross. I wonder why you like Supercross better than Motocross. So I figured you'd pick Motocross just because it's all like knockdown, drag out manliness. Because I think they're doing more things in a shorter space or time. Oh, I got and you. And I'm, I'm getting to go like, holy shit. And, and Motocross, they're, From a fan they're hauling you, ass. Yeah. But I think I'm getting able to I'm, – I'm seeing more – technical things happen in a shorter period of time if you I guess. were the rider what you going well i could never do super cross <laughs> so I could you're really... going motocross <laughs> <laughs> yeah does caden ride uh he right we both i raced when i was a little kid and then i've o- almost always owned a motorcycle and then yeah he's ridden you have he rides, one now yeah what do you have now uh husky fe 350 nice dude that's the one i was thinking about getting is it badass i like my bike sweet Actually, what's caden ride does he ride the same well thing? he rides mine now oh, okay he's got a crf 250 Nice, but man. It won't, it won't start, so he takes mine. <laughs> <laughs> Does it have the electric start and all that? Mine? Yeah. yeah. Dude, that's, of what course. That, that's exactly what I want to get. Um, yeah, and I think this question came up last time, but let's try to answer it again. What other form of racing would you like to try? Um, well, you know, going to do the Dakar, you know, going to try that. But ultimately, like I wanted, I've wanted to do that for a long time, but I wanted to do it to win which made me never be able to go do it because those to me those rides were very hard to get so yeah in a way but i'm okay with it too now i'm 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 cool you you've done so much but um what about if it was just in a utv and i feel like i'm like well that and that's no and that's i yeah i understand what you're saying so yeah i mean that's the thing that's opened up now is now with the utvs it does make it much more attainable to go not affordable, but attainable, hearted. yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's still expensive, but – and, yeah, I I looked at the cost of that, and it's still – Yeah, it's still pretty it's still a lot of money. Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then uh, final question. I I know you answered this one last time. Chips and guacamole or French fries and ranch? Chips and guac. Chips you, and guac all you, day. You changed that to French fries and ranch? Just on the fly. It still says ketchup. Oh. 
<laughs> I was just thinking maybe it would make I mean, it. How bougie white do we have to be in here? Dude, it's half the dudes that we talked to is like, oh, I'll take French fries, but I'm going to Mitch my ranch with the ketchup. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, dude, seriously. Um, all right, well, thank you guys all very much for tuning in. Uh, there's some guys that came in and the thoughts of uh, racing Antigo this year? Anigo? Anigo, is that what it is? It's going to be great. I've raced there before. It's right a, on. It's a cool little track. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rob. We really appreciate it, dude. Um, thank you for taking us to Tacos today. That was awesome. Um, I'm glad that you guys have had uh, uh, the opportunity to put BF Goodrich on the side of the car, change the livery up a little bit. It looks fucking awesome, man. I'm stoked on it. Yes. Um, I know that uh, Rob is stoked that you came out to the uh, adrenaline therapy sessions. Uh, what was it, last year? I, no, it was the beginning of the year. I think it was the beginning of the year. Yeah. yeah. So um, that was super cool. And uh, giving back to the community and doing all the stuff that you do is awesome, man. You're just a badass dude all around. So thank you for having us here. Likewise, pleasure to be here and honor to be here with you. I appreciate it, man. And Don also said thank you very much, Blanton, for all your services and stuff that you do. He wrote uh, a comment in, but it already passed. So, um, it was a ne- pleasure. Next week's show. We have, uh, it's going to be a motocross Monday. So we have Davey Millsaps. I don't know if you guys ever nice. heard of him, but uh, we might get uh, some good stories on him battling Trey Kennard at Anaheim. That was a good one. Uh, so we're going to talk with him at IMG Motorsports. That's going to be an awesome show. He's got uh, stories for days as well. Um, thank you very much, Rob, for having us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Robert Blanton, for being my uh, co-pilot today, my co-dog. Uh, and you didn't even have to throw up. Dude. I'm not a very good co-dog. <laughs> <laughs> you did fantastic today, bud. So thank you very much. We really appreciate all you guys uh for tuning in you guys are lifeblood i say it every single episode but it's really true because you guys are making the this show tick um i'm glad that we get to give you a little bit of insight into what happens behind the scenes and with all these fantastic people that are in the off-road community it means so much to us that everybody has uh, accepted us with open arms and that you guys are paying attention and following us because it gives us the opportunity to do the all this stuff so uh we really appreciate everybody uh that's been a sponsor of the show i'm not going to go into full detail of it i'm just going to go through the list so thank you to kate AMC. Thank you to all the guys at uh, EFX Tires, Zollinger Racing Products, Shock Therapy, Cryo Heat, and Solder Weld. You guys are awesome. We really appreciate you guys living your dirt life with us. We will see you guys next Monday. Good night. Thanks for listening to the Dirt Life Show. 